Um, I hope everyone's now refreshed and re-energized and ready for another um, interesting afternoon discussion around One Health. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to um, recap on uh, what happened yesterday before I pass you on to the co-chairs of today's ses gender session. So yesterday we welcomed 980 unique participants onto our online um, platform who, um, and at any one time we were, we were averaging over 350 people online. I think this is a really exciting sort of indication of how interested people are in One Health and what's going on in Kenya. Um, and we um, saw, um, as we were expecting, a majority of participants um, coming from Kenya, but we also had a, a global reach and we saw people come from the region, but also as far afield as um, the UK, Australia, China. Mm -hmm. So this is um, testament to a, to a great sort of um, opportunity for online um, and virtual uh, meetings. And while we also had the majority of attendees from academia, we were really pleased to see a really good selection of attendees from um, the public and private sector, as well as NGOs. So um, we kicked off our meeting yesterday. Um, we were honored to be joined by the Director General of ILRI, Dr. Jimmy Smith, um, who stressed the importance of breaking down institutional insularity, working together in solidarity in the One Health space, and really encouraging an increase in the amount of funding available to allow One Health approaches to flourish. He also made a call for um, improved surveillance and, pro and a proactive approach to prevention and preparedness. And this was echoed in our keynote speech from Professor George Warimwe, who demonstrated One Health in his approach to pr producing multi-species vaccines and who told us very emphatically that he still retains his veterinary roots whilst a, um, really sort of extolling the, the benefits of a multi-sectoral approach to his medical colleagues. Our scientific presentations ranged across a variety of spaces with epidemiology of emerging and um, endemic zoonoses, antimicrobial resistance, and branching into somewhat new areas of urban health and understanding forced migration and displaced populations as a driver for disease. Um, our scientific session was rounded off with a really lovely um, example from a pilot project in an interesting animal-human wildlife interface in Kenya, which was seen by many participants as a great example of collaborative working. Um, the talk on AMR in, in slaughterhouses was also highlighted by participants as being a great example of collaboration and a lot of interest in the, the work um, done by the um, team working in urban Nairobi and the importance of pulling in urban planners, acknowledging that the urban space is going to be the population, the, the home of the future for our global population. We did, however, note that there were aspects of One Health missing, and people really sort of noted that we needed more representation from the climate sciences, plant sciences, and the socioeconomic sphere. And this is really important for our planning um, in, for future conferences. Um, we had a re some really great comments on our need to ensure that our One Health research is policy relevant and actually sort of is, is taken up and moved into policy and practice. So I want to highlight that tomorrow we are having a, a very important discussion on this fact, and we're going to hear from um, our keynote speaker, Dr. Mark Nanyingi, on his experience of building One Health policies in the region and a great selection of policymakers um, who are going to be talking in our panel. So make sure you come back tomorrow. Um, we also, we rounded up yesterday with a great panel discussion where five eminent and experienced researchers, none of whom were vets, so we quite like to, to highlight the diversity there, um, <laughs> discussed how they apply a One Health approach to their work and what challenges they encounter. There were some really strong messages on the need for platforms for institutions to better collaborate, 
um, and share their experiences and build a common vision. The need to make a clear case for One Health to our funders and donors and the need to carry out policy relevant research. So these really echoed throughout this, the um, sessions from our keynote on, uh, from our opening statement by uh, Jimmy Smith through our keynote and onwards. Um, and we ended with a really positive message from our participants, which was about how they would go out and really try to improve their collaboration and their communication, as well as messages about enjoying the journey, the One Health journey, and that they will never give up. So as we continue our journey today, I would now like to pass on to the co-chairs for today's session, Do uh, Professor Salome Bukachi, Dr. Bernard Bett, as we now go on to consider how gender may be mainstreamed into the One Health approach. Thank you so much. Ah, I'm very sorry. I should have written, I should have kept the agenda. Please can I pass to my colleague, Dr. Nicholas Bohr to um, run us through a couple of mentee questions before we start the gender session, sorry. So thank you very much, Lian, for the recap from yesterday and for our participants, welcome back on board. Today's session will have some interesting stuff, stuff that we don't talk about, neither research, neither implementation, implementation. but we'll be, but talking, we'll be about talking about gender, <coughs> gender in One Health. We'll see what, we'll see what, that, what that involves. Then, then later on. Later on we'll talk about one health education so so today's we'll we'll, as usual, as usual, we'll log into we'll log into mint the code is, is 29 29 43 744 all right let's see what what you're getting <coughs> what does one gender in one gender health in one health mean all right, sorry, we had a technical hitch there. So we can go back. What does gender in one health mean to you? Yeah, so we are getting some responses there. And equality and access to health. Putting women at the center. Somebody say Somebody so. Say so. And, and equal opportunities. Equal opportunities. All right. Okay. Okay. So we we'll listen what gender means to us. So we we'll, we we'll listen back. We we'll listen back to our session leader, Professor, Professor Sally. Sally. Yes. Um, so welcome everyone to this session on gender and One Health. I believe we are all looking forward to the discussions that we'll have today. Yesterday, um, yesterday in some of the uh, uh, discussions. I saw people were saying that gender was missing in the One Health presentations that were done yesterday. And so today we have that time where you can come interact with uh, a group of experts on gender and One Health. So we have lined up for you um, several discussions on One Health mm -hmm. and we're looking forward to you. Hello. We can hear you okay, Salome. All right. Yeah, so one of the things we note is that although the role of an intersection of gender in One Health research, policy and practice has been recognized widely, there are still important gaps on how its principles are understood and applied routinely. Part of the challenge is that gender is a social construct that varies from one society to another and evolves over time. So uh, to help us address some issues on gender, how we can mainstream gender and what is gender, uh, we have, uh, we'll start off by a keynote presentation who will then um, give us a keynote address and later we will have a panel of experts also to have the discussions. But even as we start um, on, on the aspect of the keynote, the questions we ask ourselves is, are our interventions or is our research inclusive in a way that it includes everyone? Are we leaving some people behind? 
And how can we ensure that our research, our interventions, our policies are inclusive and includes everyone, irrespective of who they are and who they, uh, what they stand for. So to take us through this, uh, we'll have a keynote address. Uh, and we start off by inviting Helena Muguni, who is an associate professor in the Department of Infectious Disease and Global Health at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine, Tufts University, with a dual appointment at the Tufts University School of Medicine, Department of Public Health and Community Medicine. She has technical expertise in infectious disease, gender, and one health. She is currently the risk reduction co-lead for the Tufts-led USAID-funded Stop Spillover One Health grant that focuses on supporting countries in Africa and Asia to stop spillover of infectious diseases from wildlife to humans, as well as reduce amplification and spread in the human population. She is also the principal investigator for an IDRC funded gender and livestock vaccines innovations grant that focuses on women's empowerment and engagement in the livestock vaccine value chain in three countries in Kenya, Uganda and Rwanda. She works at the cutting edge of the One Health Initiative, which combines a multidisciplinary approach and animal, human and environmental health knowledge for monitoring and prevention of current and emerging diseases and integrates gender components into her work as part of her approach in strengthening collaboration and capacities of the sectors and actors involved in health service delivery. So join me together as we uh, welcome Helen Amoguni. Helen, you have the floor. Um. Um, thank you so much uh, to you, uh, Salome, and to Dr. Bet, and to the Kenya One Health Conference uh, for giving me this opportunity. It's very exciting to be speaking in Kenya because I'm Kenyan, although I work at Tufts University. And I'm really excited to know that you have a session on gender in One Health because many times at many conferences, uh, people forget the gender aspect of it. So it's a great opportunity for me to be able to discuss uh, gender considerations in One Health research policy and practice. Uh, we all know that One Health requires a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach where silos are removed. And many times I say, it's not just about the traditional disciplines of human, animal and environment. We have to look beyond those three and begin to look at what other disciplines can we bring in uh, so that we have a complete approach in one health. And so as I share today, uh, this is going to be sort of my strategy. I'm going to talk about why do we need to have this discussion on gender? Where are we currently in this discussion on gender in one health? And then what are some of the gaps and strategies for integration of gender into one health? I will use um, examples from what I've been doing for the past 10 years or so. I have worked at the one Health Interface, done many, many projects in One Health and really integrated gender into those because I'm really passionate and excited about gender. I'm a veterinarian by, by training. I'm also an infectious disease specialist, but then I'm also a gender trained specialist. So it's been such a great opportunity for me to bring these aspects together, bring infectious disease, bring veterinary medicine, and then bring in One Health and bring gender and ensure that gender principles are being integrated, mainstreamed, and that the groups I work with are really responsive um, to gender issues as we work together. So I will be talking about that and just some of the experiences we've had in the past uh, few years. Um, I decided that I'm going to start first of all by doing some definitions. I'm not going to assume that everyone understands what that, that means, what gender is and what sex is. And so just to look at the difference between sex and gender, many organisms of many species are specialized into male and female varieties, each known as sex. Sex refers to biologically defined differences between males and females. And sex is determined according to physiology, most of the time, reproductive capability, and it's a biological category. This is many times assigned at birth. Uh, and it is important to note that sometimes 
a person's genetically assigned sex does not line up with their gender identity. Gender, on the other hand, is the categorization of people with characteristics pertaining to and differentiating between femininity and masculinity. Depending on the context, these characteristics may include biological sex, sex-based social structures, such as gender roles or gender identities. In most of our cultures, mostly probably including Kenya, we look at gender from a binary uh, perspective, male and female, you know? And sometimes in other cultures, this falls outside this group. So there's a non-binary uh, view of gender and gender can cross a continuum. Some societies actually even have what they call third genders, like the hijras of South Asia and fourth genders as well. And so when we talk about gender, this refers to the culturally or socially shaped group of attributes, behaviors, opportunities associated with being a male or a female in a given ethnic tribe, country, society, religious setting. It is like Salome said, a social construction. And many times based on economic, social, political, cultural attributes and roles and responsibilities attributed to people by others or themselves. And as I said before, gender is viewed along a continuum. And that is, is, is important to remember that, that it's viewed along a continuum and that gender intersects with other factors. It intersects with age, intersects with social economics, it intersects with marginalization. So there are other issues that gender intersects with that we have to think about as well. Remember though, that gender is not just about women alone, but about the relationship between men and women. Sometimes we use the words gender and women interchangeably, most of the time because we add special programs for women to compensate for historical and even current disadvantages compared to men. But if men are not involved, it's really not gender. So I want to be able to differentiate that, that when we talk about gender, it's not just about women alone. Men engage is really an important aspect. Many times, like I've said, we associate gender with women and girls only, and then we forget about men and boys. We cannot obtain gender equality and equity without men's engagement. Many times it's also gender bias against men. And I know situations where there's been a lot of bias against men, but because there's usually a big focus on women, people forget to think about that. So as you think about gender, remember that you have to engage men in process and that you can really not achieve equality or equity without engaging men in this pro pro process. Men's engagement is actually a programmatic approach. So I would say that we also have to systematically think about engaging men systemically in into the structure, you know, as part of the programs that we do, if we want to achieve gender equity or equality or even women's empowerment. We talk about equality and equity. I wanted to take an opportunity to differentiate those two. Um, they're both very important terms and I like to think about it this way. Um, Supposing you have a group of people and you want to give them shoes, you know, all of them, you have 20 people in a room, you decide, hey, I want to give all these people shoes, and you give them all a size 10 shoe, that to me is equality. You've given everyone a shoe in the room, but does the size 10 shoe fit someone who wears a size 2, or does it fit someone who wears a size 15? Now, if you give everyone the shoe that fits, then we are talking about equity in that sense. And I think many of you have seen this picture, you know, where you're talking about uh, where you have people viewing a football game and the first one on the left looks at where one gets more than is needed. That's usually the reality, uh, while the other gets less and uh, some get none. And then the one talking about equality is to give everyone an equal box, you know? So you assume everyone benefits the same and everyone's need is the same. So you provide the same support. The third one is equity. You say, oh, who needs a little more? The person on the right is a bit shorter. They do need two boxes as opposed to the person in the middle. The person on the left is tall enough to be able to see across. But the fourth one then is about justice where you remove the barrier now. 
instead of having boxes and people and the fence and blocking people, you remove that barrier and then it allows everyone to be able to view uh, what, what is happening on the other side. So basically removing the cause of the inequity, you address that. Many times this is systemic, removing the systemic barriers that cause inequity. And one more term I wanted to talk about is empowerment. We discussed this a lot when we are talking about women empowerment or empowering women within gender lines, transformation, being able to transform uh, women's lives or men's lives or whoever we are dealing with. And so empowerment is increasing the capacity of individuals and groups to make informed intentional choices and then transforming, they're able to then transform those choices into the desired actions and outcomes. And so if we look at this with those definitions in mind, uh, feel free to look this up and find more definitions. But I thought many times there's so many words we use interchangeably and defining them at the beginning might be helpful. So why do we need to have this discussion on gender? I think as we're talking about One Health, we know that One Health is multidisciplinary. People call it interdisciplinary. Some people call it transdisciplinary. I'm not gonna go into the definition of those terms, but it's looking at multiple disciplines working together to achieve optimal health for humans, animals, plants, and the environment. We can't just look at the three disciplines, like I said, human health, animal health, environmental health. The first image shows all the different disciplines and it doesn't include all of them. Many, some are still left out, but examples of different disciplines that you have to think about as you think of One Health. Social sciences and humanities, you can see on my screen, is a big part of that. Engineering, art sciences, ecology. And I'll look at, I'll give you some examples of where these have really played a big role. So coming from an infectious disease background, uh, many times I use examples related to infectious disease. And if we think about things that drive, drivers of infectious disease, for example, the bottom picture, land use, climate change, economic development, globalization, and what influences those? We think about culture, we think about economics, we think about the policy, the behavior. As you mentioned those, see how gender is so much intertwined with that. When you think about culture, you're thinking, what's the culture of this community? What do men and women do differently? Who has access to what? Who controls what within that culture? Economics as well. Uh, if you look at policies and behaviors, certain behaviors are attributed to females, certain are attributed to males just because of the roles that they play in society. So those are gender related. And so coming from that perspective, one of the things that we've always thought about or recognized is that gender is actually a one health core competency. I've worked with Afrohone Network the past um, 10 years and one of the things they recognized from the beginning is the importance of identifying gender as a core One Health competency. As you think about other One Health core competencies like leadership, management, um, collaboration and partnership, behavior change, gender is right there included in those soft skill competencies. And you cannot do risk analysis or infectious disease management or even ecosystem health without thinking about gender issues. So being able to integrate them into your thinking, into our thinking as we, as we discuss right from the beginning, as we begin to implement this One Health approach, as we're saying, we're gonna be breaking silos, break the silos then, thinking about gender as a core competency, just the way you think about leadership, the way you think about collaboration and partnership, the way you think about risk analysis, allows you to be able to integrate that and mainstream it into your programs from the beginning. I like this chart graph, we call it our spillover ecosystem uh, that we use in Stop Spillover. And one thing that we did is we sat down and thought about what are the drivers of spillover? What is it that if we wanted to stop spillover, what should we think about? And we thought about behavioral factors, gender and cultural factors virus ecology, food insecurity, they're all intertwined. So we don't want gender to be an addition. We want it to be a key part of One Health, even as we think through that. Many times we talk about the sustainable development goals. Uh, I'm sure you've discussed this and talked about them. And if you look at sustainable de development goals, number five is gender equality. I personally call this One Health goal. Because when I look at these sustainable development goals from one to 17, 
they're really very one health focus. You're talking about life on land, climate change, um, agriculture, industrialization, and health for humans, for animals, and for our ecosystem. So these are really interlinked together and they're important to think about it. So when we talk about gender right now, we're talking about it because we realize just what a big role it plays in the emergence of new epidemics, in antimicrobial resistance, in food insecurity as well, and other One Health key components. Remember, One Health looks at complex issues. What are those complex issues like AMR that we need to be discussing? How do we approach, how do we create an approach to provide optimum health for humans, animals, and environment, even as we're looking at, um, at antimicrobial resistance. And then one important thing is that we have to recognize that different genders are differently affected and they're differently vulnerable to the risks due to either biological situations, economic, it could be social, political realities, and that consequences differ for different genders. If you're a female, you don't have access to healthcare. Maybe you can't go to health to seek medical help if you're sick because you're home caring for your children. Or you can't go to seek medical help because you're relying on your husband to provide transport for you. Those are different situations um, um, right there. If you're a man and you're going out hunting into the forest and you're the one uh, capturing the wildlife and everything, your risks are very different from the woman who is at home. So thinking about that, that different genders are differently affected. And of course, one of the things we wanna do as we think about One Health is create this effective equitable policies. We don't want to do One Health and then end up perpetuating gender inequities. We want to be able to increase the number of One Health practitioners in research policy and practice with gender analysis competence. This is a really big one for me. So I'm going to come back to that later. Of course, we're thinking about increasing community participation in implementation of One Health, understanding those gender-based behavioral risks, varies, you know, and how people, different people respond to it. And I already mentioned intersectionality, increased understanding that gender intersects with age, with economics, with social status. We do recognize that experiences from past outbreaks, for example, shows that integrating gender analysis into preparedness and response is really, really important. And I'll give you an example of that uh, shortly. And so as we think about gender as a one health core competency, I feel like that's the starting point. You have to think about gender as a one health core competency. And as you think about your structure, implementing one health, if you're doing research, if you're doing policy implementation, or if you are in the practice of one health, how do you then make sure that you're thinking about health? One about gender. How do you become effective? How are you aware of gender dynamics? How do you apply those gender sensitive and gender transformative approaches in your One Health uh, activities that you're doing? And so as I think about this, I feel like for the One Health community, maybe some three key things that we need to recognize to do is, one, are we able to recognize gender gaps and then identify resources to address those gaps? Are we able to analyze how gender impacts and is impacted by one health threats? And then can we become transformative agents by promoting gender equality and equity in all aspects of our work? Where are we currently right now with uh, gender? I think there's been a massive push to integrate gender into research, policy, and practice. We know that many funding organizations, USAID, IDFC, WHO, the European Commission, uh, NIH, all of them require that you put in gender and sex in your intervention proposals or your research proposals, it's become a big thing. Uh, they will not review your proposal if there's no gender component included in it. So that in itself is something. In research, associations of scientific editors, for example, the European one, has formed a gender policy committee to improve sex and gender reporting practices across all scientific fields. We do have a global call to action issued for gender to be included in research impact assessment. As well, there's so many tools that are available to measure gender related changes in different projects. Uh, we, are, we are currently talking about PROWARE, we're talking about WELLY, we're talking about 
other to the Care International SAA, you know. So there are all these tools that we can use to be able to integrate um, gender into different projects. And One Health is currently really well, well placed to build on these systems that are already in place. And yet gaps still exist. And I'm gonna give you example of some practical gaps that, that exist currently, of course, with the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We've read so much about the inequities, the gender inequities, the gender imbalances, the disparities, gender-related disparities. That, oh, I apologize for that I'm in an open place, so the door just banged. Uh, but the gender-based disparities that uh, are seen with livelihoods, with food security, and paid care work as well in different places. Now we are talking about antimicrobial resistance. But many times as people are talking about anti-AMR stewardship, I've noticed there's a big focus on AMR, uh, on like medical practitioners, uh, veterinarians, you know, uh, and farmers, as well as environmental issues. I've heard very few people talk about specifically women's roles in AMR. And if you just take a step back, even in Kenya and think about that, who is it that administers antibiotics when there's a sick person in their home? There's a very high chance that it's the female in that home. We do know from literature, we do know from statistics that most farmers, 75% maybe of livestock work in most homes are done by women. And so if they're not included in this discussion, they're the ones administering these antibiotics when their animals are sick. They're the ones administering antibiotics when their children are sick or other members of their family are sick. And they have to be a really big component of that. I will give you another example. I think yesterday there were so many papers presented on Rift Valley fever. So Rift Valley fever is a big deal, you know, and we know that it kills many animals. Um, it kills cattle, it kills sheep and goats. There's lots of abortion that go, go with that. But correct me if I'm wrong, the current policy in Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda is to vaccinate cattle. You know, and many times they forget that the biggest animals that have the biggest impact when there's a rift valley fever outbreak are shot, sheep and goats. And these are on, on, honestly the animals that are most of most value to women in the community. And so if you go out and you vaccinate cattle because cattle seem really, really important, the animals that die the most from Rift Valley fever are sheep and goats. And yet the policy really focuses on vaccinating cattle. And so as we think about these issues uh, that arise, uh, unless you strategically and very proactively specifically address gender issues, you will you'll find yourself at the end trying to sort of bring in um, add, add it in as an add-on. Uh, we talked about the Ebola outbreak in West Africa many times in other, in other times. And one of the things that happened, we know in Liberia is within the first three months of the Ebola outbreak, 75% of the people who died were women. And that time, I think until they brought in social scientists, they brought in anthropologists, they brought in gender specialists to sort of begin to analyze that and look at that, People are just working from, this is a public health emergency and we deal with this from a public health perspective. But if from the beginning they thought about like, this is not just a public health emergency. If it's a public health emergency, we have to consider it from a holistic perspective. Think of the social issues, think of gender related issues, think of cultural issues that affect that. Then it would have been easier to sort of avoid these ads that's going on. Same thing with the coronavirus. I think coronavirus, um, I'm just putting this up a little bit. We do know that there was a sex difference. In the beginning, when that started in many countries, more men were dying. This is what this graph, for every 10 females, 11 males were affected. But also for every 10 females who died, 14 men uh, died. And so there was, a sex, this was, people are not sure if it's a sex difference or it's a gender-based difference. And this is still being discussed a lot, you know, in the world right now. We're thinking, is it because of biological uh, related? Maybe men have a different system, what they're calling the cytokine storm, or is it because of characteristics 
you know, that men, some say maybe men smoke a little more in these societies or they don't, or men do this. And that's why they're exposed. So maybe related to gender roles. I think people are still examining that and investigating, but just besides the, the effects or the people who are affected, the impacts and the consequences of the coronavirus. I think in the US, they called this the coronavirus recession, the she session. There was a month between August and September where 865,000 women dropped out of the labor workforce. In the same time period, only 216,000 men exited the workforce. And meanwhile, one in four women are considering reducing work hours, moving to part-time roles, taking leave of absence from work, or stepping away from the workforce altogether. We understood the increase in domestic violence diverse genders, intersectionality. There was a month, I think it was March this year, where 140,000 people lost their jobs and 100% of them were women. And so as we think about that, uh, looking at, hey, what is the effect? And then what are the consequences? Just giving this example uh, from the US is really important. So then what are some of the gaps and some of the strategies for integration of gender into one health? I'm using some of the experiences that we've had before, working with Afrohorn in Africa uh, for many, many years. I, I thought I would start with this. I don't know if people, a lot of people talk about like, hey, let's, let's um, integrate gender and mainstream gender into our project, into One Health. But you can't do that if you don't have people to do it. So for me, I think the first one that I'm starting with is how do we ensure that you, the One Health practitioners, are gender champions. And I don't mean to say I, you're a gender expert. You don't have to become a gender expert. But to really elevate gender is to build your capacity in whatever you're doing so that you are able to do gender analysis. Whichever project you're involved in, at your level, you're able to actually begin to think through these gender analytical considerations. You know, How can I be able, just even as a public health person, as a veterinarian, as an environmental scientist, as an engineer, how do I make sure that every time I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm bringing in gender considerations? So, and this increases the number of people who can effectively carry out gender analysis in research, advocate for gender policies and practice. And so that for me was one of the things that we learned over the last few years, just increasing the number of people who are gender aware and actually training them not to become gender experts, but to know how to do gender analysis, to know how to be able to engage, even if they're preparing a research proposal or they're in the field implementing a research project, to ask that, what can we, what can we do? Are we leaving out something? Are we recognizing the gaps? Are we doing anything to ensure that we are including gender specific indicators and assessment tools in what we are doing? So that for me is the number one, uh, um, issue that we can be able to, to do. And I just wanted to share this. this we, we started this with Afrohoon. This created the first team of gender champions. And the, a lot of these are not, they don't have gender background. They're just like veterinarians, environmental scientists, um, um, economists, you know, people from different backgrounds that we brought together and say, as part of our project, we are really going to take them and turn them into gender champions, give them gender analysis training, make sure that in every country, whatever project is going on, they are participating. Because there are very few, honestly, we have to confess, there are very few gender experts around the world. And sometimes they're spread so thin. And many times, scientists, co-scientists, medical doctors, veterinarians, um, public health people, sort of look at them as all oh, those social scientists over there, you know, and it's really hard to bring them in. But if we take this team of One Health practitioners and turn them into gender champions, then that's a really important thing to do. And so these are currently in the Afro-Hoon countries working on different, um, I can share that many of them have gone on to become gender champions. Uh, we have a few who are doing their PhDs in gender and, that's not where we started. They were just interested in gender issues and just learning about them. I would say the second point, especially for One Health, is One Health is starting out 
and has built over the last five, 10 years. And one of the ways we've talked about integrating One Health into anything is ensuring that people are trained. People are trained on One Health leadership. People are trained on One Health collaboration and partnership. People are trained on infectious disease management with a One Health perspective. And so one of the other things that we did is made sure that we integrated gender into all these training, One Health training modules. So Afrohun developed 16 One Health modules. Some of them are on risk analysis that you can use if you want to train people from a One Health perspective on risk analysis. In that module, we integrated gender into it. We had this team of gender experts working to input sections on gender. So besides creating a standalone gender, One Health and infectious disease module, we work to make sure that we are integrating this into all the other modules. And so when someone says, oh, I'm going to train people, maybe government people, on risk analysis. They take that module and they go and use it. Within that module, there's a section of gender, so they cannot leave it out. So being able to integrate this was really, really an important part. And we think that's a more sustainable way. You have a standalone gender model, so if someone wants it, they can use it. But you make sure that every training that you do, you have integrated gender into that. And then, of course, we know this a lot that you can't just do gender sort of in the air. You have to develop a roadmap. Usually that's a strategy and a policy as well. So recognizing the gender capacities of different partners. You can't do this without doing that. Um, use a very simple tool. I usually use the gender equality continuum tool. If I have a group of people, uh, just to sort of identify where do they stand? Where are they on the continuum? Are they gender transformative or what their organizations as well. So this allows us to then map out and understand who are your partners? What are the gender capacities of your different partners? Because One Health is very multidisciplinary. You're gonna meet so many different partners from different sections. You want to sort of have that baseline, first of all, to understand where is each partner gender wise? Are you dealing with a group of people who have a policy? They're very inclusive, they're gender transformative. Or are you dealing with a group of people who don't know they've not, maybe it's a pharmaceutical company or something like that. That's not their business. They don't talk about it. Then that allows you to think through how do you then approach that group to make sure they're integrating gender into it. So if you have a strategy, it allows you to also have an accountability framework. It allows you to develop gender indicators as well uh, to be able to scale up best practices. And then also funding uh, to track special funding. We know many times that there isn't much funding for gender, you know? So uh, this is the gender equality continuum that I was talking about that you can use very simply. But I was saying many times we know that there isn't much funding for gender. One of the things that we did uh, that I thought was very successful is we piggybacked on a lot of other activities. Uh, we had our team of gender champions who we are working with and if they were going to do any training, we know we don't have funds to run our own gender training, but hey, we're going to have an infectious disease management training, which I'm going to be leading, which I did many times. I'm going to be training, uh, for example, uh, this one, I'm gonna train, this is the Ethiopian One Health uh, group. I'm gonna be training the Ethiopian One Health team on risk analysis. As part of that risk analysis, I integrate gender. I know I don't have funds to do gender separately, but as part of this training, I include it. So really aggressively taking advantage of what you have in front of you. So what I would say is for people who are dealing with gender, don't wait many times, of course, campaign for funds, but there's so many opportunities to be able to jump in and talk about gender and be able to use it. I can tell you that with Afro Hoon, whenever I would walk into the room, everyone talked about gender because I was so aggressively championing it that it became like a common thing. And I'm like, yes, that's what I want you to do. I want everyone to be thinking about that because as you talk about it, then you begin to practice. That's first of all, one of the sessions. Another key point is just building allies. It is really, really important to build a coalition of allies within research, within policy, in the practitioner world. And you might be surprised, your ally might just be a dean of, of a school, or it might be a policymaker in the Ministry of Health, or it might be a community organization 
And so being able to identify who your allies are and working with those ones, who is it that I can identify who can advocate for this? You know, for me, who can help me advocate for things? And we must, when you're thinking about allies, you also have to understand what is it that drives those allies. You must understand their incentive and their drivers as well. And then have a clear plan to address their incentives. Have a clear plan to address, because that's the only way someone, what will I benefit if I come and I'm able to work with you? How do I benefit from this? And then, of course, this is an example of uh, in Rwanda, we just trained a group of district level planners on how to do gender budgeting, taking advantage of systems already in place and building on top of those. So Rwanda had a gender training manual. They have the system in place where they're very excited about uh, doing gender but implementation, moving it from implementation. There was no budget on it. They developed these beautiful gender mod modules that they use for they could use for planners, but they'd never done it. We came in and said, you know what? We can work with you on that. We can provide funding to be able to train your planners on how to include gender in their budgets. You know, and so they just went through all the planners went through this training, and they're going. They're just getting ready to go into a budgeting session, and we think that's a big thing if they can go to their district. And they say, okay, we talked about gender now, let's make sure we include gender into the budgeting. And that's really, really important. And as I round up, uh, we have to measure progress, of course, embedding gender and cultural opportunities, measuring what we are doing. We've talked about different ways in which we can measure this. We can be able to uh, measure One Health platforms using the One Health platforms as well. And so as we think through, through this and being able to measure this, being able to recognize that um, you have opportunities like rapid response teams, one health platforms in different countries, other formalized structures and embed gender and cultural opportunities into that. I want to say that women are their own best advocates. So many times we talk about women empowerment. Uh, of course, we talk about this because uh, when we talk about gender, this is that we have, we always have to like look at women and opportunities for empowerment because historically, economically, culturally, they've sort of been left behind. And so we want to sort of raise them to that level of men as well. And so using women as their own best advocates. And we have tools that we've applied in the field. We, one of the really cool tools that we use uh, is what we call photo, photo voice, where we allow women to tell their own stories. We take those stories, we use them to make policy briefs and we share those. We use calendars so that women can be able to collect their own data. You know, hey, this is for an animal health project. Did my animal die today? They can put it on the calendar. Did I treat my animal today? They put it on a calendar. Did I go for a training? They put it on a calendar. So they become the data collectors themselves. And then we take those stories and we put them in a zine, in a magazine, and we share those with policymakers. We share them on Twitter. We share them on WhatsApp. And it's the woman telling her story. Of course, one of the key things is data. Um, I left this for last because I know this is at the foremost in people's minds already today, talking about data and not just sex disaggregated gender, gender sensitive indicators, proactively considering gender and of course, intersectionality. And then my final statement is communication, communicating and messaging uh, gender responsive, gender transformative messages. And this is just an example. Many times people say policeman, and even if it's a woman, you know, but if you say police officer, then that is so inclusive. People will argue, oh, when we say man, we really, it's generic. It means both male and female. No, usually it translates to male, you know? So trying our best to be able to, even as we communicate, as we talk about different messages, crafting all one health messages, recognizing that outcomes of our work will have different impacts for different genders. I want to suggest at the end that organizational learning uh, is really, really important. If you are a community of One Health actors as we are, how are we tracking what we're doing? How are we staying relevant with gender issues? How are we staying viable and effective? So being able to come back and review. So we had this conference, we talked about gender. What did we go and do? Can we do a survey? Can we do find out what people are actually doing about it? 
And then just to conclude, concluding remarks, um, like I said before, integrate gender as a core competency. It's already a one health core competency. And so just taking advantage of it and doing it uh, from the beginning, engaging both women and men together, M and E as well, aiming to transform systems and structural barriers, which is one health is about. It's breaking those silos and barriers as well. Gender training, especially gender analysis, as many people as possible. Uh, not, don't just leave it for the gender experts. Train core team of people who can do gender analysis in their projects, in their work, you know, with, in whatever area they are. And of course, like I say, take advantage of every opportunity and piggyback on that if you have an opportunity. Even if you don't have funding sometimes, you know, take the advantage of that and put it in your opportunity. And so I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Asante Sana. I want to recognize Afrohun, uh, uh, the project that we worked with for a long time, as well as IDRC, and of course, Tufts University, and many other partners who we've been working together over the last 10 years to talk about gender in one health. And it is really exciting to know that this is becoming a key framework and a key part of what the Kenya One Health pro, uh, team of people are doing. Thank you, Salome. Thank you very much, Helen, for that very interesting and very informative presentation. And uh, even as we can note on the chat, uh, many people are quite happy and quite um, um, have, have benefited a lot from your presentation. Thank you. And so maybe just a question to start us off. You're a veterinary uh, professional. How, how have you managed to um, incorporate or how have you managed to move from being, okay, you're a vet, but how have you managed to integrate gender such that you're speaking like a gender expert, yet your professionalism is, is veterinary? So maybe just tell us so that others can also learn from what, how you journeyed through. So, um, so I can tell you that my, what, the thing that drove me to gender, and I'll, I'll take a minute to tell you, is I worked in Taita uh, of Kenya, and I was a veterinarian going to the field all the time. And I would go to the field and a farmer would, uh, the farmer would come for me from the office, you know? And so I would, come, the farmer who came for me was always a man. And then I would go to the home and I would find that most of the time, the person who knew about the disease, the infection and everything was the woman. And initially I did this three way. I would go to the farm and then because the man asked me to go, he'd be like, okay, ask what's wrong with your animal? And then he turns to the wife and asks her and then she tells him and then he tells me. So then one day I was like, why am I doing this? Like I could just talk to the woman directly because she's actually the one doing all the work. Uh, so I really started thinking about this gen and I, I started seeing them applying in different issues like gender roles, the way the way they are in in health, you know, as well, and in animal health as well. And I deliberately, so I had an opportunity to deliberately choose to go and do a master's in gender. So I went and did a master's, being a veterinarian, I still went and did a master's in gender and development. And then I started working combining that information on veterinary medicine and, and gender as well. And I remember then, more probably 20, 30 years ago, I was one of the few people who had those two, like what I would say, like disciplines. Like I was able to combine like veterinary medicine and gender together. Like I was trained in both areas. And so that has given me an opportunity to be able to champion that throughout. But I'm saying though that even though I'm a gender expert, in the project that we currently have, I have an IDRC grant that focuses on livestock vaccine innovation. And in this project, we are working with veterinarians, we are working with a lot of uh, people who didn't have a gender background. And we brought them in and we did gender training for them. And we did, because we're like, if I can take a veterinarian and I can be able to train that veterinarian to think from a gender perspective, Whatever they're doing, they'll be able to do it. And so we've been able to actually do that, bring them in and do that. We are doing to get the same thing with a stop spillover project, saying we have medical practitioners, we have economists, we have, how do we take all these different people and really create champions out of them? So deliberately, we've created trainings that we are deliberately using 
we follow up, we talk about it. And I can tell you, I'm really passionate about it. So everyone knows Helen is so passionate about gender that yeah, we use it, we use it a lot, but just a little bit, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Helen. Um, uh, there's a question on the chat. What is your advice if we identify gender inequity in our research areas, but the communities seem to be comfortable with their traditional roles? Example, um, sorry, I've missed it. Um, Yeah, ex example, women do not want to take certain decisions. So how do you handle a situation where you notice that there are some gender inequities in the community, yet the community, because of the traditions they have grown up in, they do not want to change? How do you bring about so, this um, change? So um, I would say that most of the time that's, it's always a cultural issue, isn't it? We work in a community where the culture has been this way and you go to a meeting, I'll just give you an example. You go to a meeting in Western Kenya or in Turkana and you call the meeting and the men sit at the front and the women sit at the back and they'll not say a word. You know, or if not, um, they're, they're so, it's so used to being that way. I think creating awareness. One of the things I've learned is many times if given the opportunity, people want to stand up. And this is really important because that's where men engage comes in, engaging men in the process. I give an example that I, I worked in Southern Sudan. And when I was working in Southern Sudan, I was look, doing veterinary medicine and gender. It took me four months just meeting with men before they allowed me to meet their wives. You know, and I was in there to do a gender project, but I went every time and we had discussions with the men and we talked about it. And, and then one day, like, like I would ask like, oh, what do you do? Who does this? And they'd be like, I control everything. And then I'm like, but who actually milks the cow? And they'd be like, oh, my wife does that. And I'm like, oh, who actually takes care of the God? And then one day they say, well, since we've been talking about this, my wife does one, two, three, four. Why don't you go talk to her? You know, so, I feel like many times people don't recognize, um, especially I had a colleague who said to her until she came into a group, things were just normal. You know, she never thought about this as a gender difference. You know, it was just what she'd been brought up doing. That's just what she'd done ever since she was a kid. So exposure, talking about it, creating awareness, about it really challenges people, both men and women, to think about their roles and recognizing that sometimes some of these roles are really disempowering, you know, and we don't want people disempowered. We want to be able to empower people. Yeah. I, I know that I'm not, I may not be able to answer all the questions, but I am available. My email is available. So if anyone wants to be able to send me an email or have a longer discussion, I'm I am available to do that. One last one both one health and gender concepts. So I, a dichotomy arises. Is it mainstreaming gender to one health or mainstreaming one health in gender? So I'm going to approach this from what's one health, okay? What, what, what one health is this bringing multiple disciplines together to be able to optimize health for humans, animals, and environment. How do we do that? What do we call this multiple disciplines? Like I mentioned at the beginning, these multiple disciplines are engineers, they're gender specialists, they're medical doctors, they're social scientists, they're all, they're, you know, all these anthropologists, all this group of people fitting in to implement the One Health. Um, because we have One Health is actually breaking silos. And so if you think about it from that, you cannot do One Health without breaking these silos. Gender is one of those competencies. As we, one of the things that when in the earlier days of One Health, we came up with what they call One Health core competencies. And if you read them, you have leadership as a One Health core competency. How do you create One Health leaders? Collaboration and partnership. How do we collaborate in a One Health manner? You know, um, behavior change. How do we change the behaviors of people to begin to think from a One Health perspective? Gender. How do we include gender to be, for people to allow to reduce these inequities that cause these silos in One Health? So I wouldn't approach it of 
do we integrate One Health into gender or into or gender into One Health? I think gender is a One Health competency, core competency, as much as the other competencies are. And if you intend to implement a successful One Health program, you have to think about gender as you are thinking about the other competencies as well. So much, Helen, for creating time to give us a very interesting and very informative talk that has really opened our eyes a lot about gender. And I believe even the audience um, are, are quite more knowledgeable about the gender issues in One Health as opposed to when they began. So I will now, I will now release you because I know you have to be elsewhere and uh, okay. we'll continue on with the session. Um, okay. Thank yeah. you very much. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And we um, applaud Helen for the very good presentation. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I note quite quickly is that gender has to be on the table, but we have to ensure that gender is on the table even as we are engaging in our uh, disciplines, in our various disciplines, because it has a very critical role it plays in terms of addressing the inequities and the inequalities that exist in health. So now we move on to our second uh, session of the day. And this is, uh, we have a team of uh, uh, gender experts who will be part of a panel and each of them are going to give us uh, presentations. And then after that, we will have a panel discussion just to address some of the issues you may have, uh, you may ha still have on, on, on gender and also maybe some of the issues that were raised uh, following uh, the presentation by um, Helen. So I have the pleasure to introduce Kathleen Al Culverson, who is a faculty member in animal sciences at the University of Florida and has over 25 years of experience with gender analysis, assessments, publications, and evaluations in East and West Africa, Central America, Caribbean, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and United States. This includes experience in formal, and non-formal education with publications of training materials and curricula, textbooks and refereed journal articles. She has developed courses, workshops and seminars on topics related to training, community development, gender and participatory development. She currently serves as the senior gender scientist for the USAID Livestock Systems Innovation Lab as well as providing technical gender support to numerous other international projects. So Kathleen is here to um, take us through gender and her presentation is going to look at gender in One Health. And so Kathleen, I believe uh, she's muted already and she's, yeah. She is so available. I will make an effort to share my screen. And thank you so much, Salome and Bernard, for inviting me to have the opportunity. You can see I'm actually in my house <laughs> presenting from Florida. And a very good afternoon to everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to join my colleagues from Kenya. And I'll just give you a very brief background. I am uh, Dr. Kathleen Culberson, and I was formerly one of the ILRI gender scientists. So I'm very delighted to be back with my, my colleagues and friends again. And I'll give just a little brief background on how I ended up uh, being a gender scientist because it's somewhat similar to Helen. I actually began as an animal science professor for many years and my specialty is dairy and small ruminants. And I had the opportunity at one point in my life to join Heifer International, which is a large nonprofit organization that works worldwide with smallholder farmers associated with livestock in particular. And it opened my eyes to the importance of not only a systems approach to uh, integrating the, the use of livestock, but also really looking at the social aspects. And this was just an incredible eye-opening experience for me, caused me to change my career, ended up becoming a gender scientist. And like Helen, I've been doing this for a very long period of time. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit more about the applied work I have been doing associated with uh, gender and One Health. And let me see if I can um, <clears throat> do what I need to do here and uh, share my screen. I'm not sure if you guys are able to do that or um, I can do that from here. Let me see what we can do. 
Okay. And hopefully everything will work. All right. Very good. Can everyone see that and hear that? I hope. Um, we're going to talk yes, a little can. bit about. Very good. You can. You're able to. Very good. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, building on what Helen had to say. What an excellent overview. I really appreciate the the depth in which she covered the, this topic, because for many folks who don't understand the connection between the two, it's kind of a, a foreign territory. But it has been something that's been increasingly important, not only in the work that I do in various parts of the world, but I think everyone, particularly funders, are now starting to realize that without the connections, we are not going to be successful in the project work that we do. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, proceed and hope everything moves smoothly, talking about what are the connections between gender and one health, particularly from an applied perspective and very much focused on working in East Africa. So we've talked a little bit about the fact that gender is very important. We've talked a little bit about what gender is. We need to start to think about um, what are some of the issues associated with particularly working within farming systems with men, women, boys, and girls. And for those of us who work in these types of systems, we recognize that women and children are very involved in particularly working with small livestock, uh, poultry, and also sheep and goats, um, shoats, as Helen mentioned, which is a unique term really to East Africa, and working with dairy. So it's important for us to understand who is actually doing these, these different activities. We also talked a little bit about what gender means. It means that we are basically looking at the socio-cultural aspects of what is assigned to you as a role based on the sex you are born as, as a child. We also need to talk a little bit about where do we typically see men and boys and women and girls in different types of livestock value chains. And usually what we're going to see, and this is a general statement, is that men are much more involved in production and management of large animals, such as dairy, such as uh, equine species, such as buffalo. And women are more responsible for the smaller types of livestock as well as very specifically involved in certain aspects of the dairy value chain associated with not only the production aspects, but also the processing of dairy products. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more detail later on um, as we move through the, the presentation. One thing I wanna mention though, for those of you who may not be familiar with some of the issues that we think about when we start discussing foodborne diseases and food hazards and food safety, uh, aspects. If we look at the, the slide on the left and we start to look at what is some of the, the global burden of foodborne diseases, and we think about uh, worldwide, one in 10 people will fall ill to some aspect of foodborne diseases. And this can be a variety of different things. But we also realize that we lose what are called healthy life years lost because of this uh, aspect of falling ill to foodborne diseases. And when I talk about a healthy life year, I mean your ability to actually uh, function productively in society. So it's very important to realize also that a third of all children, we're talking about children under five, die from some aspect of foodborne diseases, usually associated with extreme diarrhea or loss of uh, fluids in their system, dehydration. If we look at the slide on the right, we look at specifically the African region, and these are this is data by the World Health Organization, and we look at the fact that a third of all global death toll associated in the African region is associated with foodborne diseases. And this is a very, very high number. And specifically, we're looking at certain um, bacteria associated with non-typhoidal salmon salmonella, as well as E. coli, as well as cholera. And so I'll be talking a little bit about some of the uh, bacterial diseases associated with foodborne um, hazards, but it's really important to recognize this. This is a very significant problem in different parts of the world, and it particularly has a gendered aspect to it. So I mentioned that there are more than just biological hazards when we talk about food safety and foodborne uh, issues. We can talk about bacteria, such as E. coli, such as salmonella, such as cholera, and we can talk about parasites, such as taneous solium and some of the other parasites that uh, those of us who are working with livestock are dealing with. But we also need to recognize that there are chemical hazards associated with food safety issues. 
particularly if we're looking at um, aspects of hygiene, if we're looking at aspects of cleaning products, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important when we are doing visits to farms and we're looking at issues associated with foodborne and food safety issues that we consider not only the biological, but also the chemical and in, on occasion also the physical. Do we see aspects of actual uh, dirt or wood or slivers of glass or different things associated with um, actually transmitting uh, food hazards that are not necessarily biological or chemical? As I mentioned previously, um, very high percentages of the populations in not only developed but developing countries are affected by foodborne diseases, food safety hazards and particularly when we start looking at things associated with diarrhea, because dehydration is one of the most common um, aspects of uh, foodborne diseases, and it, it kills an estimated 2.2 million people annually, most of whom are children under five. And as I mentioned, this is not only a, a major issue associated with dehydration and possible death, but also long-term complications that can be uh, debilitating to the individual and affect their, their daily life years that they can contribute um, to the, the planet. So some of the challenges faced in the African region specifically, and these are not uncommon and not unknown to many of us that, that work in these areas, unsafe water and poor environmental hygiene. When we start looking at issues around potable water, and particularly do, do people have running water, period, um, this becomes one of the most major issues that we are confronting when we work in villages, when we work in rural areas, and even when we work in, in urban areas. We also need to recognize that in many places that we work, there's very weak foodborne disease surveillance or processes in place whatsoever. So um, I work in a variety of different places where they don't have standards associated with, with foodborne disease. And this really uh, presents a problem when we start to look at how can we actually inspect places that uh, do not have any standards to begin with. When we look at uh, the small and medium scale producers that we work with in various parts of the world, it's very difficult for them to be able to comply with regulations if they do exist. And if they don't have safe running water in their facilities or they don't have stainless steel or they have poor surfaces, et cetera, et cetera we start looking at all of the different issues that are associated with trying to provide safe foods in the first place. As I mentioned previously, we often don't have standardized processes or regulations, and there's very weak enforcement because there's no regular inspections. Um, a number of the places that I work in Ethiopia uh, are definitely um, part of this, this problem. Uh, Inadequate capacity for food safety, not only in processing facilities where I've spent time, but also when we start to look at issues associated with uh, individual small scale production, uh, very much a problem. Um, very often we don't have uh, systematized cooperation between the stakeholders that are involved in different livestock value chains associated with not only production and transportation, but processing and regulations. And as I mentioned previously, the adjusted disability life years that will be lost because of the fact we don't have many of these um, factors I just described, but also because of the fact that um, it's just an overwhelming problem. We have a very high incidence of uh, lost disability life years, uh, particularly in Africa. So if we take a look at animal source foods, which I'm really gonna be focusing on in this presentation, and we start to look at what are the life years lost associated with all foods per 100,000. And then we look at specifically animal source foods and we realize that over a third of the uh, global burden of disease is associated with animal source foods, particularly when we look at issues with non-typhoidal salmonella, we look at tania solium, which is tapeworms, we look at Campylobacter, Paragonimus, et cetera, et cetera, we see that we have a very high incidence, particularly of Salmonella, uh, Tania, and Campylobacter. And I have been working on projects in Ethiopia and now soon to start in Kenya, associated specifically with these organisms because they are such, such a problem. But just recognize that when we are working with different kinds of animal source foods, meat, eggs, milk, dairy products, et cetera, we have a very high percentage of um, global disease transmission. So going back to linking, 
what Helen was talking about in her presentation, the issues around gender, around social systems, around farming systems, with the issues of One Health and foodborne disease. We have to really think about, so who is most affected in the family by foodborne disease? How do we know? Why do we know? And what can we do about it? So if we start to think about how are we gonna be actually able to determine this, for those of you who have actually participated in or conducted a gender analysis, it is probably one of the fastest ways to really begin to determine who do we need to zero in on as a, an audience or a populace associated with specific foodborne disease hazards. And I should just mention, um, for those of you who may not recognize this, this photo on the right, this is a, a, a clay pot that is used in Ethiopia for milk collection and storage. And we can talk about uh, devices that people use to collect milk and, and different kinds of animal source food products um, as we go through the presentation, but there are obviously issues associated with this. So when we think about a gender analysis, um, we really need to think about a number of different things. And I always say to people, just start thinking about the W's. Think about basically who does what in the value chain. When we start looking at a value chain, we start looking at issues around production. We look at issues associated with inputs into that production aspect and all the different steps that are associated with beginning to produce a product. And if we're talking about dairy, which I'm gonna focus on in this presentation, we talk about the feeding of the cow, the grazing, the watering, the cleaning, the stall cleaning, um, who's responsible for doing all that? And then specifically, what are they doing? Are they feeding the animal? Are they giving the animal water? Are they taking care of it from a veterinary perspective? Are they milking it? Um, who, who is doing it and what are they actually doing? When they do it, what time of the day they do it is also important. Are they doing it in the morning? Are they doing it in the evening? Do they do it every day? Uh, do they do it multiple times a week? When they do it really will affect the storage, particularly of the products that we're looking at. So again, we think about dairy products, we think about fluid milk, we think about yogurt, butter, cheese, et cetera, et cetera. If they are doing um, milking early in the morning and then they are putting their milk into a storage container like we see on the right with no refrigeration and no pasteurization, we have to start thinking about what are the aspects associated with that. Okay, um, I'll keep moving. Where are they doing it? When we think about where is the milking taking place? Where is the food processing taking place? And if we think about uh, rural communities and we particularly think about are women doing the milking? Are they doing it out in the stable? as the, the cow got clean environment to be able to, to do what they need to do? Or are they standing in manure and there is potential for disease infection associated with milking the cow? And then we need to decide who is deciding about this activity. Is it the woman that's deciding what to do with the milk or how long to pasteurize it or to sell it? Or is it the man that is doing that? Okay, I'm going to keep moving here. Um, all right. Who controls the inputs? For example, when we think about production in a dairy value chain and we're thinking about the dairy uh, cows, we're thinking about who is going to determine what is being fed, when it's being fed, and if the milk is produced, the fluid milk, is it being consumed in the household or is it being sold in the market to pay for other types of household needs? So these kinds of things are the questions you're gonna ask and think about when you begin to look at ways to integrate gender into different value chains, particularly as I say, we're focusing on dairy, but you can do the same thing with poultry, with beef cattle, with sheep and goats, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so when we look at doing a gendered value chain analysis um, and we think about some of the production activities that are associated with basically a dairy value chain, looking at ways that we are going to be pr producing and either selling or consuming milk, we need to think about these different activities. For example, who is responsible for calving? Who feeds the calf? Who cleans the stall? 
who feeds the cow, who grazes, who gathers forage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we go through and we apply the questions that I just discussed to each one of those production activities. And there may be more than what we're seeing on the left side. It's important when you do an analysis of a value chain that you really understand what are all the steps that are involved. So we think again about how do we apply these questions? Who, what, when, where, who decides and who controls to each one of those production activities. We do the same thing with processing. And if we're thinking about using, um, again, the, the, the cattle example, who is going to be slaughtering the cow? Who is going to be processing the meat? Who might be transporting the meat to an abattoir or if we're dealing with dairy products to a dairy processing facility? Who will be responsible for pasteurizing or preserving the milk product and or making the meat or dairy products? So again, we apply these questions to all those different stages to think about um, who is doing what, when, where, why, and who's controlling and deciding. Same thing with transportation. Um, many times when I am looking at a value chain analysis, particularly associated with different types of livestock products, and we start on the farm with production, and then we move into how is that product being transported? Is it on bicycle? Is it in a refrigerated truck? Is it in, um, you know, on a, a donkey? There are a variety of different ways that food products are being transported. And if they're not being transported in sterile environments and under controlled circumstances, we may have real issues associated with food safety uh, concerns. And we think again about who is doing the transporting, who is pricing the dairy product, who is determining where the sales are gonna take place, what are they doing, when are they doing it, where are they doing it, who decides and who controls. And this is particularly important Again, if we're dealing with uh, unsterile environments where um, products are not being processed and or stored and or transported under ideal circumstances where we have controlled temperatures and we have sterile containers. We think about food safety, and this is where I really start to zero in um, on some of the issues associated with gender and one health. We think about the dairy products storage and or preservation. We think about who is consuming or disposing of the meat or dairy product if they consider it to be unsalvageable um, or inedible. Uh, what are they doing? Again, when are they doing it? How long is that product being stored or how long is it being consumed? Under what circumstances is it being consumed? Uh, if we do uh, an observation of the, the cooking area, what do we see in the cooking area? Do we see utensils being stored in the ground? Do we see them being cleaned with uh, potable water or boiled water? We have to really think about uh, what are the circumstances or the environmental conditions that we're looking at associated with the handling of that animal source food product. Is it being um, chopped up on a, a, a block of wood? There are lots of different things you need to observe when we're thinking about food safety issues. Not only what is being taken place, but who is doing it and who is most affected by handling that, that product. So um, one of the, the projects that have been involved in, in Ethiopia particularly looks at, at dairy value chain gendered issues and particularly looking at food safety issues. And we have a lot of conversation around not only the milking of the product, and how that product is handled, but whether or not that product is being pasteurized. And when we talk about pasteurization, we're talking about heating the milk to a certain temperature for a certain period of time to destroy microorganisms. And one of the things that I discovered is that um, obviously women are much more involved in dairy processing aspects than, than men. Uh, they're also very much more involved, particularly in Ethiopia, in caring for the cow and milking the cow. But when it came to talking about how do you preserve the product if you're going to be consuming fluid milk, um, people will say they do or don't boil the milk. And in many instances, they don't. And if they do boil the milk, what's the temperature? There's no um, thermometer, so no one really knows the temperature. And they don't really know how long they boil it for. So this is a really important aspect to think about. And then if you go a little deeper and ask, why do you boil your milk in the first place? 
Some people will actually recognize that it's unhealthy to consume milk that has not been boiled or pasteurized. But many people have no idea why they're boiled milk. They, they think it's because it's tradition. They think maybe there's a reason that we need to, to do this, but they don't really understand. And so if you think about refrigeration, we think about how many people actually in the rural areas have electricity? How many people have functioning refrigerators? And in most cases, they're preserving their milk using traditional means, either storing in containers that I showed previously or in other types of potentially unsterile containers. And um, if they're preserving their products, how are they preserving it? Under what conditions? And what are they actually doing? And when do they do it? If they're milking in the morning, are they storing the milk throughout the day to be consumed in the evening? Are they selling that milk immediately, um, which I have seen in many instances where people just drag their milk containers out to the road and then it's picked up by a cooperative. But if it's sitting there for hours in the hot sun, obviously with no refrigeration, we have to be concerned again about food safety hazards. And the other interesting question that I ask sometimes um, with people when we're talking about handling of animal source food products is what kinds of um, issues do you need to think about in your family about who consumes this product? And if we're particularly looking at issues around malnutrition with young children or with pregnant or lactating women, uh, the answers that come back are fascinating. In most instances, uh, milk will be, if it is consumed in the household, given to young children first or elderly or sick people. Um, it's not often that pregnant lactating women will drink milk. It's more often they will sell it, uh, particularly associated with, with purchasing other things like school fees. So it's really interesting to ask these questions. If, if you don't consume the milk, what happens to it? Who gets to consume it? Why don't you consume milk? And sometimes we get these incredible stories about um, why people, particularly women, are not allowed to consume animal source food products. That is a whole nother discussion at a whole nother seminar. So this is a, a graphic basically to kind of illustrate the dairy food uh, chain, particularly looking at uh, production, processing, transportation and consumption. And if we look at who is most at risk at these different stages in the dairy value chain, we look particularly at production and we see women. We look particularly at, at processing issues and we see women. When we talk about transportation and or marketing, usually the men are doing the transporting. If it's a larger commercial operation, the men will be doing the marketing. If it's a smaller operation, the women will be doing the marketing, usually associated with either small amounts of fluid milk or with uh, dairy products such as cheese and or um, butter. And consumption, obviously the entire family consumes. But if the woman and the girls are responsible for doing the handling, they may be the most exposed to contamination from the different sources that we have mentioned. Okay, so why do we care? Why do we care about integrating gender issues associated with food safety hazards and particularly associated with livestock value chains? Well, this illustration that I'm uh, using on the left, on the right is actually a picture that I took when I was working in Ethiopia pre-pandemic when we could actually get out in the field. And this is a woman who has um, milked her cows and she is getting ready to strain the milk through an old scarf. And that was how she basically um, purified the milk before she sold it. So obviously you can see there are numerous things that we need to be concerned about uh, when we look at this picture, but it's just something that you should be aware of when you start to ask questions from a gender perspective and you're particularly talking to the people that are responsible for producing the product is how do we actually handle it afterwards? So women, as I mentioned, play a very critical role in production, processing, and ensuring the safety of milk and milk products. But they are also more highly exposed to foodborne pathogens. So this is something we need to be very concerned about. They pasteurize or don't the milk before feeding it to their families, which increases the likelihood of childhood diarrhea. So this is something we really need to be aware of, particularly as I mentioned, uh, in the, the products that have been involved in Ethiopia, in many instances, I think it was about 60% of the time, the milk was not pasteurized or heated at all, and family members were consuming it raw. So obviously, there's very limited refrigeration for raw milk and dairy products. And when um, night milking occurs, frequently is stored in unsanitary containers and um, unrefrigerated until the next morning when it's either consumed or it's sold uh, on the market. 
So these are issues we need to consider, um, particularly not from a gender perspective, but also from a food safety perspective. Poorly preserved milk, as we all know, has a high risk of disease transmission, including many of the microorganisms that I discussed previously. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been doing a lot of work in Ethiopia. And uh, one of the questions that we asked about preservation of, of dairy products and about um, sanitizing the, the containers that milk is, is captured in is an interesting uh, traditional practice called chorasma, which basically involves fumigating the inside of the container that um, the milk is um, captured in and stored in. And um, this is done with a heated stick. So smoke basically is involved in helping to quote, quote, sterilize inside the container. Now this picture on the right is a woman that is demonstrating uh, for us how they actually do this fumigation. But the container that she's using is a recycled paint pot. And so we were very concerned when she told us that, that not was I concerned about the, the sterilization technique, but also the fact that she was using a recycled paint container to collect her milk in. So when we asked the question about how do you determine whether or not you dispose of a dairy product, most people say, well, we look at it and if it doesn't look good or it doesn't smell good, we throw it out. Um, but many people indicated that they were happy with keeping their dairy products without refrigeration for multiple days before consuming, which obviously again also has the potential to, to create foodborne disease hazards. So why do we care? As I mentioned, um, we talked a little bit about preferences or abilities to pasteurize dairy products. Um, we note that about 41% of the people that were interviewed restricted themselves to drinking boiling milk, boiled milk, which means the other 60% do not, which again contributes to the possibility of, of foodborne disease pathogens. Um, many of you who have worked in or live in Ethiopia recognize that uh, raw meat is eaten regularly um, by a variety of different people, not only at social events, but also at restaurants, et cetera. And this is a photograph, obviously, on the right of a restaurant that we went to associated with raw meat consumption. But it also contributes to much higher incidences of Salmonella, E. coli, and Campylobacter. Um, when we look at it from a gender perspective, Men are responsible generally for performing slaughter associated with, with cattle, and women are responsible for processing the raw meat. And frequently this is occurring not only in unsanitary conditions, but with minimal or no running water. And particularly we are concerned about the potability of the water, whether or not it's actually safe in the first place. So these are other issues that we need to consider when we look at the, the intersections between gender and uh, consumption of animal source food products. What can we do about this? Well, we've talked about this, Helen talked about this, and we need to think about what can we do? Well, the first thing that I really say, aside from doing a gender analysis, we need to decide who is gonna be most affected in the selected value chain we're working in. Is it gonna be men, women, boys, or girls? And we need to target them for our interventions, not only for potential capacity to building, but also about really helping them to understand why and how foodborne disease uh, hazards take place and what they can do to actually minimize these things. We also need to determine who's making the decisions related to food safety practices. And again, I mentioned that particularly women are very much involved in this because they're involved in not only production, but also processing and storage and then household consumption of the product. So frequently women are gonna be our primary target associated with any kind of capacity development with, um, associated with, with foodborne disease hazards. And we really need to think about if we're really working with women and we're working with rural women in situations where there's minimal infrastructure and minimal um, refrigeration, et cetera, et cetera. We need to think about um, not only what their literacy and numeracy skills are, but how can we make all of the trainings that we do very practical, very hands-on, minimal uh, handouts and texts, and really help them to understand from a practical sp perspective why foodborne disease issues are a problem and what they can do about them in their own environment. And we also need to work with local veterinarians, extension providers to understand uh, the gender aspects of the work that they do and particularly as it relates to food production and processing. So those of us who are involved in this field or um, have the interest in this field really need to be able to provide guidance, uh, technical support, as well as uh, other types of materials that can be made available to people that are working in this area. 
So that is all I have to say for now. And I think uh, if anybody's interested, feel free to please contact me. And I think, Sonomi, I don't know if we're doing Q&A at this point or we're gonna wait and do that later. Wait and do it later. Yeah, so thank you, Kathy, for your very interesting uh, presentation on One Health, looking at it from the perspective of food safety. And I believe there'll be quite some questions that will come in again uh, at the end of uh, uh, Edna's presentation. We'll take all those questions together. So um, Edna, are you on? I take this opportunity to invite Dr. Mm -hmm. Tua, who is an anthropologist working as a health systems researcher at Kemri Welcome Trust in Kenya. Before mm -hmm. joining Kemri Welcome Trust, Edna worked as a researcher at the University of Glasgow School of Social and Political Sciences and the International Livestock Research Institute. Her research interests are within the spheres of One Health, zoonotic diseases, antimicrobial resistance, and gender analysis of livelihoods and health interventions in East Africa. She holds a PhD in anthropology and an MA in gender and development studies from the University of Nairobi's Department of Anthropology, Gender and African Studies. She's here to give us reflections from two Rift Valley research projects. Welcome, Amy. Okay. Yeah, so um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. I will go ahead and uh, share my screen. Okay, um, I'll make us a uh, presentation uh, titled Gender and One Health, uh, Reflections from Two Rift Valley Fever Research Projects. Um, I hope you can see my slides okay. Yes, you're good and, to go. Okay, and um, so by way of giving a background, for the benefit of those who might not be aware what Rift Valley Fever is, so this is a viral zoonotic disease that is caused by the Rift Valley uh, virus, and it is a mosquito-borne disease uh, that is climate sensitive. In East Africa, it has been associated with above normal rains and uh, flooding. It affects domestic ruminants. These are mainly cattle, sheep, goats, and camels. And transmission in livestock is through bites of infected mosquitoes. Occurrence is characterized by mass abortions. Uh, transmission in humans is mainly through infected animal tissue and secretions. And this is the route by which uh, severe cases in humans are also acquired. And mosquitoes have a role to play in causing mild infections. So the management measures include quarantines, ban on livestock, uh, trade, and also bans on livestock um, slaughter, as well as uh, trade in livestock products and uh, vector control. So uh, livestock vaccination before an outbreak is the most effective method of controlling RVF, but this is done irregularly. So I'll give examples from the two projects. The first is on community adaptation to Rift Valley fever in Baringo County, Kenya. So this study took place in Baringo North, Baringo Central, and Baringo uh, South sub-counties of Baringo County, and can, can be seen in the map uh, we categorize the study site into four zones. We have uh, the, the side from where we have Lake Baringo and Lake Bogoria as the lowland zone, followed by the midland zone, followed by the highland. And then the extreme zone uh, is the riverine zone that uh, runs uh, along uh, River Kerio. So um, the risk factors that we established in the study site when conducting this work was that our community members did keep the susceptible species. The lowland zone was prone to uh, flooding and also cases of Rift Valley fever had been reported earlier before we conducted this study. So we also established that community members had limited knowledge of RVF etiology and its transmission patterns. And here is a low understanding of how the human, animal and environment interfaces interact uh, leading to RVF occurrence. We also observed that uh, there would be uh, risk in the event of an RVF 
agri-agri outbreak coming from the consumption patterns of meats and blood for food and also consumption of animal products from sick and um, dead animals and um, this we established uh, was seen one as a means of providing food and also two as a means of mitigating the losses that come with disease and the loss of an animal we also established that there would be risk um, coming from the centrality of livestock products when it comes to caregiving of the sick. For example, we find that milk, um, aside from being a food, it is also used to administer medicines, particularly to children. We find that meat is considered uh, culturally acceptable and respectful uh, food for somebody that is unwell or has been unwell for a while. And meat stock um, is used to administer both biomedical and herbal medicines to adults. Also, we did establish that there was a culture where um, the, an extract called Ayande, and this is an extract from a goat's rumen, um, is believed to be medicinal and it is given to sick people. And the reason why um, it is considered medicinal is the assumption that because goats being browsers feed from many plants, most of them medicinal, um, therefore it means whatever that can be found in their rumen carries medicinal properties and is therefore upon slaughter extracted and given to sick people. So I also uh, found that there was a, a challenge of uh, poor disposal of um, dead animals and fetuses. And one we've seen an option is, has been consumption, but then there are others who discarded this in the open or fed to dogs or practiced burying or burning. Now, burning was not so popular, uh, but burying did occur. And we also established that um, there were contestations in burying as a means of disposal of sick or dead animals, particularly in the lowland zone, uh, because uh, the community residing in the area had a cultural belief that interment is only for human bodies, and therefore you cannot do the same for animal uh, bodies, so to speak. And then we also established that in the event of an outbreak, the current livestock management practices would also put the people at risk. And this includes handling sick livestock with bare hands or aborting animals with bare hands and the use of biomedical and herbal medicines in self-treating of livestock. Here we established that most farmers do not rely on vets for treatment of sick livestock. They do it themselves, either using um, herbal medicines or biomedical medical medicines. So um, this, uh, this section shows uh, the engagement in risk practices. And what we can see um, is that we found that men were more likely to engage in risk practices around consumption, around slaughter of uh, sick animals or skinning of dead animals, also um, engaging in disposal and also um, the whole dimension of uh, treating sick livestock and acquiring the repeated services around that. So other risk factors that we established being that uh, we looked at how this intersections with other factors. One, in terms of location, we found that people from the highland zone practiced less uh, risk practices than those in the riverine, midland and lowland zones. And those from the lowland zones uh, practiced more risk practices than any of the categories by ethnicity. We established that the pastoral community that resided in the lowland zone practiced more risk practices than the agro-pastoral community that um, resided in the riverine, midland, and uh, highland zone. We also established that the likelihood of engaging in safe practices increased with knowledge of risk practices. However, age, marital status, number of children in the household, education level, household type, and the main livelihood activities that uh, um, interviewees engaged in were not found to influence risk to RVF. So in terms of implications for RVF management and control, in this study, we established that RVF exposure is likely to follow a gender division of labor pattern production systems and geographic location. We also established that in outbreak times, there's a possibility of a clash between public health measures, cultural practices around foods, feeding, 
caregiving of sick people and disposal of sick and dead livestock. And therefore, uh, we thought that um, having continuous contextualized awareness creation on risk factors of RVF and other zoonotic diseases will be useful in these communities. So for more of this work, uh, you can uh, get this paper. It's an open access paper. The second study um, is a gen focused on gendered barriers to livestock vaccine uptake in Kenya and Uganda. The study in Kenya took place in Muranga County and Kwale County, while in Uganda, it took place in Arua and Ibanda districts. So we did establish that there were extrinsic and intrinsic barriers that prevented farmers from um, accessing uh, vac livestock vaccines. And when I say farmers here, I mean both men and women farmers. So the extrinsic barriers included the cost of the vaccine, um, the choice of vaccination points by the veterinary departments, distances that farmers have to take to go to those set vaccination points, the waiting times when they are going to seek the service, the durations for which the vaccination campaigns are set, whether it is one day or two day, uh, vaccine quantities available, uh, vaccine side effects, and also um, available infrastructure for restraining animals during the vaccination exercise the number of uh, veterinary officers available. And this had a direct impact on the waiting times in the vaccination points. Uh, we also found that another extrinsic barrier was uh, uh, vaccination campaign information dissemination strategies. If these were not uh, well done, then it meant the information did not spread as far as it was intended to. And also provision of vaccines when diseases have already spread and also irregular provision of vaccines. Intrinsic barriers, these are the ones that were within the control of community uh, members, included a lack of or limited access to vaccination campaigns, depending on uh, ability to reach where this information is disseminated from, a lack of awareness on the importance of vaccine, different types of fears, for example, a fear of uh, an animal or one's animal getting a uh, disease from coming to contact with other animals. One needle being shared among many animals in the vaccination process, a uh, fear of vaccine side effects, fear of being shamed by other community members for having poor animals with poor health, fear of losing the animal animals in the process of taking them to and from the vaccination uh, points and also in the vaccination points and also fear of attracting theft, uh, especially when one had animals that were admirable. And then um, we found that um, there were challenges with moving livestock to vaccination points and restraining them uh, at, uh, for the vaccination, as well as mistrust of vaccines and veterinary personnel. And this led to a lot of vaccine hesitancy. And then beliefs, this could be religious. For example, we did come across a Christian sect group that did not believe in the use of biomedical uh, medicine uh, interventions, both for human and livestock, and therefore would not present their livestock for vaccination, as well as other cultural beliefs like having totem animals where vaccination was seen as interfering with their sanctity and their stand their space in the in the in their cultural meaning and then we also found that uh, livestock ownership conflicts and pre pre preference for curative and preventive care services did contribute and here the preference was for curative services because you're treating something that you can see as opposed to preventing services preventive services which are for something that uh, is not there and might probably not occur anyway. So um, the key barriers for men and women in these study areas, in Muranga we established that for men, their key barriers, one, was the choice of the vaccination place and two, the cost of the vaccine. And this for them were an issue because they they added up uh, the cost, the direct and the indirect costs of accessing vaccines and being the breadwinner, the role of provi providing the finances for this was uh, mainly theirs. For women, the choice of the vaccination place was their biggest barrier. 
being that uh, the farmers that we went to kept dairy cattle that were zero grazed. So moving these animals that are not accustomed to moving lengthy distances was quite a challenge for women who are mostly left with this task. In Kuala, we established for men that um, two two um, challenges carried almost similar weight, and this is the lack of the infrastructure to hold uh, livestock during the vaccination process and access to information. Same case was for women, but for women, the lack of information was more dire than the lack of uh, the uh, vaccination infrastructure. And then in Ibanda, Uganda, for men, we established that the cost of vaccine was the main barrier for men. For women, cost was an issue, but their case was uh, a lot more interesting because they had more intrinsic uh, um, issues that were affecting them. And these were around access to information and having limited capacity to make decision over which livestock um, to be vaccinated. For Arua, cost of vaccine was the main issue. So we were interested in pushing back and trying to understand this intra-household decision-making pattern and how it influences um, vaccine uptake. So for this, um, we established that uh, when there's a call to have animals vaccinated, um, in male-headed households with men living locally, that is both spouses are at home uh, within the same vicinity all or most of the time, in Muranga, men in Muranga and Arua, men primarily made decisions, but these were in to, to an extent influenced by women. Uh, whereas in Ibanda and Kwale, only men made this decision, so women were not involved. In de facto female-headed households, and these are households where the male head of household lives away from the home, uh, um, in Muranga, Kwale, and Ibanda, all of these areas, the decisions around vaccination were primarily made by men, and women had an influence in this because they were the ones who were at home and they were the ones who knew what was ongoing. In Dijah female-headed households, uh, these are households where the women were either widowed, they were um, separated, divorced, or had never married. Essentially, women-only um, headed households. In Muranga and Arua, women primarily made the decisions, but there was an influence from um, other family members, such as children and siblings of the woman or parents of the woman making the decision. And in Kuala and Ibanda, we found that it is women who made these decisions only. So implications for RVF management and control, we find that uh, it's in, in our, uh, vaccine uptake, including RVF vaccine uptake, is influenced by extrinsic and intrinsic um, factors. The extrinsic factors are cost of vaccine, choice of vaccination points, and having the requisite infrastructure for restraining animals for vaccination, while the intrinsic factors are around access to information and decision-making capacity of um, livestock vaccine uptake. So for veterinary departments, when planning campaigns, it is important to consider consider these barriers to enable them to make um, uh, services that respond to farmer needs and to enhance our vaccine uptake. And although we acknowledge that the veterinary departments cannot be able to handle all intrinsic barriers, we do acknowledge that there are continuous interactions with community members coupled with information sharing can increase trust and encourage uptake of vaccines. For example, over helping farmers to overcome barriers like uh, vaccine hesitancy, uh, mistrust of veterinary um, vaccines and mistrust of veterinary officer and fears around um, um, vaccine side effects. So for more on this study, um, can access it uh, from this paper. It's an open access paper. So I wish to acknowledge um, the projects under which this work was done, the respective funders for the project, um, the research teams involved in this work, as well as the people and the county governments of Baringo, Kwale, and Muranga, as well as the, uh, the leadership in Ibanda and Arua districts in Uganda and, uh, and the local teams and the communities. Thank you, over. Thank you very much, Edna, for your very interesting presentation, giving more details on um, Rift Valley fever, social, cultural, and gender aspects.
So mm -hmm. now I will invite Kathy Powers on to also put on her, her camera. Mm -hmm. And she's coming on board. Edna, I'd just like to ask you one question. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest challenge in integrating gender in one health research? Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest barriers I have seen, and it was alluded to earlier, is the fact that uh, when you're working in multidisciplinary teams, there's always the assumption that other sciences are better than social sciences and anthropology and gender sciences. So they are always seen as sciences of the last resort. If we, let's just have it there just in case. But the challenge with that is um, you find that projects will go out and get these other types of data. And sometimes they cannot link it to context. And that is where the social sciences become most useful and also become um, uh, useful in helping to understand um, the findings that we're getting. I also would say that uh, I've seen social scientists away from getting into these spaces for fear of one acceptance and also having to you know push back to be able to create a space where you can actually be able to contribute meaningfully. Thanks Edmund. Kathy, what has been your experience and your challenge also in integrating one health in your research in one health gender in one health <laughs> research? <laughs> I, I totally agree with what Edna has to say that uh, frequently uh, social scientists are not highly respected. I would say um, one of the biggest interesting challenges that I face is because of the fact that I am an animal science scientist by first training um, and then applied social sciences to that is to really think about how can we be more active in, in integrating the two, particularly if we look at biophysical scientists and we look at social scientists and to find spaces where there's opportunity to intersect uh, not only through conferences and through joint research projects, but for each of the individuals to learn more about what the other person does. And I think that's been really helpful for me um, as, a, as a social scientist is to really understand the issues associated with, with animal science and particularly around food safety perspectives, because I also have a background in microbiology. But um, I think it's just really important to think about ways that we can find spaces to understand each other better and to integrate our work together. A great way to uh, bring this to an end. I know there are many other questions that have been there on the chat. And I would like to request Kathy and Edna, if you could take a few minutes, maybe some 10 minutes of your time to just respond to those questions on the chat as we now hand over to Nick and uh, take a break on, uh, to do the mentee as we go on to the next session. Thank you very great. much, everyone. Um, we are grateful to all the panelists and everyone else who um, presented the keynote address for very useful presentations that will help us move our research, our policy issues forward in terms of being more inclusive in, uh, our, uh, in the work that we do. So Nick, take over and thank you very much. And thank you very much, Salome, for that session, and even to our speakers for bringing to light some new ideas. It's now maybe a turn to listen from the from the audience and our participants. How often they listen? They've heard about One Health, or are they hearing about it for the first time? What are some of the challenges that you encounter while integrating gender into One Health? Yeah, so some people are saying it feels overwhelming. There is a general feeling about a poor understanding of this, of this topic. Reluctancy in terms of implementing this. Not enough knowledge. So we hope the conference will be able to address this. Cultural issues, truly. Yeah, for those online joining us online, let's keep sharing your ideas as we grab a cup of coffee in readiness for the next session. Right. Yes, so let's aim to come back at four to start the next session. Yep, thank you. Keep the comments coming. We look at some of the insightful comments that are coming in and most people are saying, most, most people are saying that there is, women are not included in the One Health agenda Cultural practices are bringing along these issues. 
difficulties assessing women in research settings here yeah, for sure resource constraints poor understanding of gender cultural barriers yeah so thank you very much for your contribution so i think maybe from now on we'll carry on with in inclusivity in terms of gender because we as we've been encouraged from the talk so at this session we are behind schedule a bit but i'd love to welcome wellington ekaya from Hillary. he'll be taking us through the education session and gender welcome wellington over to you Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> workshop participants, all organizers. I uh, recognize everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Wellington Ekai, as Nika said. I work here at ILRI as head of capacity development. It's my pleasure to be your session chair and facilitator this afternoon. Uh, we were two of us to handle this session, but my co chair. Uh, got into another event, so he will not be able to join us. But nevertheless, we're excited to have the session running uh, as planned. This session is on One Health Education and Capacity Strengthening uh, uh, in One Health. It's quite uh, an exciting discussion and quite challenging as well. I uh, just want to flash back on the first day uh, when we were trying to understand what is One Health. Uh, if my memory serves me right, a number of words and phrases came up. There were all these words and phrases about communication, uh, cross-disciplinary, sharing, coordination, collaboration, uh, integrative, uh, very cross-cutting uh, issues. Uh, those were really key words that help, help to frame, that will help to frame the discussion we shall be having this afternoon. So then putting all that in perspective, uh, the key question is, or among the key questions we are saying, so if this is what One Health entails, and then in terms of uh, education and capacity strengthening, uh, what skills, uh, capacities and capabilities do we need uh, really? And how do we grow this? Where are we? Uh, where are we headed? What are the strategies? So these are uh, just some of the questions that could run in someone's mind as you prepare for this uh, session. Uh, but of course, uh, we have organized the session so that we can discuss, we can engage, we can listen to various people, experts, practitioners in this area uh, to help us understand uh, this whole topic of One Health Education and capacity strengthening. Just to give an overview of the session, how it is organized, uh, we'll start off uh, with a keynote presentation uh, from somebody uh, we will introduce. Uh, the, is, the person is not able to be with us today, but they have uh, pre-recorded uh, the keynote presentation, and that is Professor Njenga Munene, the Vice Chancellor of uh, ZTEC University here uh, in Kenya. After that, we shall get into a bit of a deep dive uh, we have invited five very uh, active, uh, I call them triple E, uh, presenters, uh, E meaning experienced, uh, engaging, and very excited about this conference. They'll give us their presentations, give some perspectives, uh, a deep dive kind of, so that we get to understand what are some of the critical issues. After that, we'll do a bit of menti uh, to engage uh, the audience. And then we'll get into a panel discussion, another deep dive. Uh, the panel discussion is on strategies for developing, implementing, and sustaining one health education in our higher learning institutions. So that is the key, uh, the gist of the, of the discussion. And then after that, of course, we'll have a bit of engagement and the session will end. All right. So without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure if our people are ready uh, to invite our keynote uh, presenter, uh, that is Professor uh, Njenga Munene. He is a professor in clinical veterinary medicine. Uh, he's a distinguished scholar who has published widely, supervised many postgraduate uh, students, uh, mentored staff, 
managed veterinary programs at university, uh, many universities actually. Uh, I was together with him at some point uh, at University of Nairobi uh, for quite a number of years, over 30 years. Uh, so he's really an accomplished uh, person to be speaking to us. He has been Dean, Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, of Egerton University. And now he is the Vice Chancellor of ZTEC University. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Njenga Munene uh, to give his presentation uh, that he prepared uh, for this conference. So over to you, uh, Professor Njenga Munene in absentia. So good morning for those who are in the region where we are and good uh, night for those who are in the United States. I know it's still uh, at night. And uh, good morning for those who are in countries like Germany uh, where the sun is uh, have just risen. I want to greet you all uh, on this particular morning and uh, to present a short discussion on emerging pandemic threats and other group of challenges, implications of lessons learned on innovations and technology in one health education. So my name is Professor Njenga Monene, a veterinary surgeon um, who have taught in the university for 34 years and uh, have been very keen in research in one health. Having been involved a lot in doing research in Kibera, where there is close interactions of humans and animals, and where zoonoses sometimes do occur. And these are the issues that we need to look at when it comes to One Health. I am also one of the founder deans of the One Health uh, East and Central Africa which was a share and now changed to afro -Hoon. And I'm happy that it is growing and changing, but uh, Professor Bazio of Makere has not changed. I think he's still the same strong and focused leader. And that's why uh, afro -Hoon is still growing. So I greet you all and welcome you to my short presentation. This slide um, shows uh, people preparing to bury uh, a person who died of COVID-19 uh, last year. And uh, one of the things that uh, made COVID-19 such a scare was the way we handled uh, cases of people who died. The people uh, responded with fear. Uh, they responded with apprehension, which, which is natural for things that uh, people don't understand. Uh, and uh, the way people are being treated when they were suspect cases of uh, uh, cases, suspect cases, and instead of uh, seeing people who uh, got infected with uh, uh, COVID, they became victims. And uh, therefore the language itself uh, and the fear uh, that was instilled by arresting people who are suspected of COVID-19 created a very difficult position for many people. And that's why a lot of people ended up not presenting themselves in hospitals uh, to be treated because of the stigmatization that was occurring as far as COVID-19 was concerned. But over the many years, uh, there has been notable pandemics in the last 100 years. The Spanish flu, 1918 to 1919. And they say that in some places it went on up to 1922, which was a period of four years. So we are not yet through with four years. And over 40 million people died out of the H1N1, the swine flu. Um, what uh, many people have never understood and the scientists have yet to determine whether the H1N1 came from humans to pigs, or it came from pigs uh, to humans, but whichever way, it ended up uh, killing very many uh, uh, people in the world. And uh, the use of masks was intense uh, at that time. The Asian flu, what they call the influenza pandemic, it was caused by H2N2, 1956 to 1958. About 2 million people died. 
influenza pandemic H3N2, 1968, about a million people died. And the continuing pandemic, uh, the HIV AIDS 1981 to date, about that 6.3 million uh, people have died of HIV up to the year 2020. But those of you who remember how HIV was in the 80s, people had the same phobia and fear uh, like they do have for, for COVID-19 today. SARS 2002, 2004, a coronavirus, the deaths were few, but uh, it is good that uh, the world acted very fast and contained uh, the disease before widespread um, spread in the in the world, seven seventy four people died. That's more number compared to what have uh, been lost. Swine flu, influenza A virus, two thousand and nine. Interestingly, this one was caused by the same virus that caused the 1918, 1919 Spanish flu. And uh, 575,400 people died. Uh, fortunately, it was also contained uh, fairly fast and did not spread as quickly as has happened today. The Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Corona, 2012 to date, is still spreading, but low grade. Uh, so far, 941 people have died as of May 2020. And now the latest of our scare and uh, what is killing many people. Uh, there are few people who don't know people who have died uh, of COVID-19. Uh, from 2019 to date, so far 5.17 million have died and the numbers are growing by the day. It is something that is worrisome. But more interesting is what have Corona does. Corona has changed the way we do things. So what are the factors that have been influencing spread of uh, diseases across boundaries and across uh, populations? Human and animal interactions, eating habits, uh, sexual behavior like uh, HIV AIDS, human social behavior and activities, air travel and other human movements. These have been major when it comes to spread of uh, coronavirus. Uh, those of you uh, who can remember this short history of uh, the virus starting from Wuhan and literally spreading in the world within a very short time. Uh, this mainly was facilitated by human travel and uh, the lockdowns that followed uh, through the spread, probably a much bigger population would have been lost had we not contained uh, human travel. Other diseases like avian flu, uh, bad migration, misinformation. Uh, currently uh, uh, in Kenya and quite a few countries, not a few, many countries of the world, there's resistance to vaccination. And this is mainly fueled by misinformation. People are not being given the right information and uh, our inability to counter that misinformation, especially through the social media, uh, remains a big uh, challenge to ensuring that uh, vaccination occurs uh, throughout all the vulnerable human population. So not following established proved, uh, proven protocols. Some people are still very resistant to wearing masks. Uh, this weekend, I met uh, a couple. Uh, the husband is very concerned because the wife is extremely resistant. Uh, she says she doesn't want to wear the masks and she doesn't want to be vaccinated. So the husband has, uh, has been vaccinated. Uh, he wears a mask. But uh, he was saying, please pray for me that uh, my wife doesn't end up with uh, 
coronavirus because I am extremely vulnerable with that. So the resistance has been great in terms of vaccinations and in terms of um, in, in terms of uh, following protocols. Uh, I'm told by a friend of mine who lives in Belgium that uh, there are some regions where they cannot talk about vaccination without the risk of uh, getting backlash from their neighborhood. So this is something that we all need to think through and ask ourselves whether we are actually acting on information or we are acting on uh, rumors. This is a, a picture that uh, was uh, put in, on media on uh, COVID-19 affecting lions in Singapore. And this was also happening to the people who are taking care of uh, these lions. So the government agency said for Asiatic uh, lions at the night safari, as well as one African lion at the Singapore Zoo, zoo had exhibited mild signs of sickness, including coughing, sneezing, lethargy, and therefore, and they tested positive for COVID-19. And this was upon exposure to staff from Andai Wildlife Group who later tested positive for COVID-19. Therefore, we must ask ourselves, is it possible that the current outbreak can be sustained and maintained within the animal population so that even as we vaccinate human beings, that there can be risk of continued sustenance of the virus within the animal population. And this is important for us as uh, scientists to consider when it comes to research on COVID-19, just like it is with the diseases like rabies, which have both a wild cycle, what we call the sylvatic cycle, and the domestic cycle, where the virus is maintained within the bats and within the wild uh, canines. And then once it gets to the domestic canines, it ends up as a fair within the human population. We must be concerned about the emerging and re-emerging diseases. Emerging infections, a new or newly identified pathogen or syndrome that has been colonized over the last two or three decades that has resulted in new manifestations of infectious diseases. The emerging diseases or what they call resurging diseases, known or previously identified pathogens or syndrome that is increasing in incidence, expanding into new geographic areas, affecting new population groups or threatening to increase in the near future. These are diseases that have been found around for decades or centuries, but have come back in different form or locations. It is important for all of us to remember, and I think that is something that all of us need to be reminded. The 75% of emerging and emerging diseases are zoonotic. They are shared between animals and humans. And therefore, we must get concerned that when we start having re-emerging diseases and emerging diseases. Emerging diseases, these have been the pandemics we have talked about, H5N1, avian influenza, the Nipah virus, Hedra virus, Enterovirus, SARS, Hadda virus, Brumunai syndrome, Lassa virus, uh, Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome, and now COVID-19. Those can be classified as emerging diseases because they were not there for a very long time. Uh, the prions, you remember the issue of uh, 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 the variant Krejfeld Jacob disease, uh, which is a human form of uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, a product uh, which is uh, suspected to have moved from sheep uh, to animal feeds or cattle feed, and then the uh, bovine, and then uh, at the end of the day, affecting humans. Bacterial ones, E. coli O157, uh, H7, anthrax, 
uh, has remained as a threat because of its use in bioterrorism and the uh, protozoal diseases like cryptosporidiosis. The emerging or resurging diseases Ebola, uh, this uh, mainly uh, seems to be fueled by our eating habits of uh, occasionally eating the, the our neighbors, our near relatives, the apes in the tropical forest, uh, which is a very big risk. Rift Valley fever, a likely uh, outbreak every time we have excess rains because of the nature of its spread. The human monkeypox, the West Nile virus, dengue fever, yellow fever, and Marburg hemorrhagic fever. All these are resurging diseases. And depending on the environment, they can recur with the serious uh, consequence. Bacterial cholera, this is a disease known for many years, typhoid fever, diphtheria, plague, vancomycin resistant staphylococcus aureus, and multi drug resistant tuberculosis, protozoal diseases, drug resistant malaria. And it's the, the, especially the issue of resistance to antibiotics or antimicrobials. Uh, it must remain as a top concern for all of us as human beings. We are not discovering new antimicrobials every so often. Yet the continued abuse and misuse of antimicrobials, either in uh, the human population or in livestock, uh, remains a big challenge and continues to remain a threat uh, to human beings in terms of disease control and uh, containment of uh, diseases. Factors that are responsible for emerging and emerging of diseases, economic development, poverty, poor sanitation, land use and cross human animal interactions, climate change, human demographics and behavior, international travel and commerce, and misuse of antimicrobials. Because as we talk about human economic development, too many things change. People tend to encroach to increase the agricultural output, encroaching into forest areas. Poverty, poor sanitation, land use, and uh, human interactions. All these are issues that we must get concerned as human beings as we continue to think about how to deal with that problem. Other major group of challenges that affect uh, human and animal health, industrial waste, solid, liquid, and gases. All of us know of situations where gases uh, or liquids or solids have found their way into the food chain in the long run, either through animals or directly through to us, we end up uh, getting uh, into problems with the pollutants, pollution of fresh water sources, service and underground, uh, too much nitrogen, too much fertilizers, too many uh, pesticides. These are products and requirements when you are doing uh, commercial agriculture. And that has tended to uh, cause serious pollution of uh, water. And uh, the world must be concerned because the, the fresh water constitutes an extremely small percentage of uh, global water volume. Most of the water worldwide is only about 2% is fresh water. The rest of the water, almost 98%, uh, over 95% of water is uh, uh, salty and therefore not uh, suitable for human consumption. Social media and unproven information on the world, world, world wide web. This has been a disaster in this COVID 19 period. All manner of falsehoods have been spread that the vaccine is, uh, people are being tagged with the uh, chips uh, and all manner of things. People are going to become infertile. Uh, men will stop uh, producing and so will women. And all those uh, things have been spread to an extent that people have come to believe that it is possible that they are causing problems. And uh, we must uh, readdress ourselves to the value that uh, 
false uh, uh, descriptions of what vaccines will result to will lead to. Let me now take a little time and talk a little about One Health. Uh, One Health uh, recognizes the interdependence of human, animal, and environmental health. That a holistic uh, and that a holistic approach uh, of well-being for all will lead to improved health outcomes and enhanced resilience. Because we live in one world, our animals, ourselves, and in that environment is where we grow, that's what we eat, it's where we live. We don't have another world to live in. And therefore, one health becomes a, a, it's a, it's a global contract between ourselves, between our animals, and between our environment. So that uh, our environment produces what we need, provides the environment in which we live, and suitable for both our animals and ourselves. And a breakdown on either side will always lead to a problem on the other side. When we have human activities that destroy the environment, it will have consequences in health, it will have consequences in animal uh, welfare, it will have consequences in human welfare. If you look at this uh, presentation, and this was uh, in Kibera, you can see very nice ducks uh, scavenging on open uh, drains and human beings uh, doing their own things. And the risk of course, is that uh, these ducks will produce eggs, which will be eaten or they themselves will be food on the table but at the end of the day, you must ask yourself, what will happen if prob probably there is contamination of this uh, food and people end up eating it? What is the composition of what these animals are eating? That cannot be described unless an analysis is done of the content of the water flowing, the waste water. So these animals can be a big source of problems to the people who are waiting to eat those animals either themselves as meat or their products as eggs. These are pigs uh, scavenging in uh, open sewers, open drains. They will still find their way on the table for people to eat. And you must ask ourselves, what is the repercussion? What is the effect? What are the likely out, uh, outcomes? Either the, the animals will have contamination of bacteria or they end up with metals within the muscles, which in itself uh, creates a risk uh, to human health. See this kind of situation, children uh, doing different things uh, in an open dump, dump site, the risks for these children being pricked by sharps and uh, injured, the risk of breathing uh, wrong things and even uh, getting themselves uh, infected because the composition of the garbage, uh, nobody knows what it is. It could be medical materials, it could be uh, industrial material, it could be a risk to these children and therefore, the interaction between the environment and the people who are living in this kind of uh, environment becomes a very real risk uh, to human health. So we must ask ourselves, what are the healthcare, in, uh, healthcare innovations? Healthcare innovation is to develop or improve health policies, systems, products, and technologies and services, and delivery methods that improve people's health with a special focus on needs of vulnerable populations. And there have been several uh, advancements. The electronic health records, the M health, the telemedicine, telehealth,
photo technology, self-service uh, kiosk, remote monitoring tools, sensor, and wearable technology. These days you can wear a watch that tells you the rate of your pass, the, the kilometers you have walked, and the balance you need to walk to burn enough uh, calories, wireless communication. And in Kenya, during COVID-19, there was great increase in the use of mobile money. We have been a, a leader in uh, electronic money transfer. And this reduced enormously the need for people to go to the shops and uh, collect cash, which in itself was a big innovation. And uh, it is important to appreciate the government for ensuring that the charges were reduced for small amounts of money and therefore taking care of the highly vulnerable uh, groups. Positive effects of technology, they have helped in tracking of uh, chronic illnesses and communicate vital information to doctors. The health apps have helped in track diets, exercise and mental information online medical service records that give access to test results and allow you to fill prescriptions. Virtual doctors, this was and is very hard during this COVID-19 pandemic. People are avoiding going to hospitals simply because they think the hospitals are very high risk. And therefore, uh, a lot of uh, discussions uh, occur between doctors and the patients is the genetic profiling of different serotypes or variants of pathogens. It's much easier than it was before and highly automated vaccine production and fast supply chain. All these are products of uh, technology. So what are the lessons on COVID-19 response? The first thing I would like to say is that COVID-19 has been a real disruptor of uh, a normal life. As a teaching institution ourselves, uh, we had to close the face-to-face -face learning. But uh, our response determined on whether we were going to survive as, a, as an enterprise or we were going to sink as an enterprise. And as a response, uh, we ensured that we transited from face-to-face -face learning to digital learning within three days. The beauty is that the bureaucracy, we don't have bureaucracy and therefore we updating our systems took only two days and we are back to normal teaching. And the lessons that we learned were uh, very, very, very deep in terms of the value of other players when it comes to COVID-19. There is need, in my view, for continued preparation for an expected outbreak of disease. Uh, I don't think there was a country that was ready for COVID-19. That's why even the most developed countries had, where they, when the infections became too many, they had to pitch tents and create hospitals out of parking we didn't have enough respirators and neither did we have enough ICU beds globally. And therefore, in my view, it is important for us to continue preparing for the unknown in order to avoid situations where we can land with what we landed with last year and part of this year. The world need to be better connected and institutions need to be more connected. For us, we were extremely lucky that Kenneth, uh, which supplies uh, internet services to institutions, uh, to universities and institutions, was extremely supported. We were also very, very lucky that uh, Safaricom came in and supported us a lot in giving bundles for our students at very subsidized cost. And therefore, the interconnections that we had, the issue of CRISP, the Kenya Library 
uh, information uh, services, uh, availing uh, online material uh, to our students, enable them to continue with learning because of the connectivity. And therefore, it is important that uh, the world be better connected and the world institutions be better connected. I think there is a better aggressive and factual information through all medias of communication to counter misinformation, especially from social media, thus making it difficult to contain outbreaks like it is happening with COVID-19. And I think this to me is, a, is, a, is an issue that we need to address very aggressively um, through the uh, normal media, through the social media, so that uh, people can see a different view of what is being given versus v what is the fact. The other thing is avoiding stigmatization and profiling of affected persons, making other affected persons from seeking medical support in time. This to me was one of the biggest problems of managing COVID-19 at the beginning. People are afraid of saying they, they are sick and quite a number of people died in their homes, avoiding hospitals, avoiding uh, medical care, because uh, they were being treated like they are uh, literally the cause of the problem they were in. And considering that the virus is spread through uh, air, uh, really there, there, is, there is no contribution for, for the person, unless of course he goes to the world parties and food are happening in other countries where people want to be infected so that they are not vaccinated. Greater acceptance and practice of e-commerce is a, a big thing. And expanding education on one health in schools and colleges for people to appreciate the need of interconnection of animals, environment, and animal health. We need to address the issue of wealth creation to remove people from extremes of poverty that make them very vulnerable. So we, we need to create uh, wealth and ensure that people are not uh, living in uh, environments that are totally unacceptable for human uh, habitation. The issue of controlled uh, investment in mitigation against pollution I think it's an issue that is global and something we need to think about. And provision of sanitary facilities and uh, san proper sanitation to avoid situations where uh, human population are exposed unnecessarily uh, to uh, either pathogens or pollutants. Being self-reliant in all key needs uh, to handle pandemics and other needs. Uh, you are aware, and all of us are aware, that the supply chain were grossly affected by COVID-19 and uh, travel restrictions. And therefore, every nation must make efforts to ensure that they are self-reliant on things that they require to handle issues like pandemics. It calls upon, in my view, for the government to reconsider very seriously, uh, either here or in other countries, the issue of supply chain for things that we require uh, as I then accept the new normal of online meetings, whether family, like the one we are holding now, research, or in politics. I think one of the biggest uh, challenges in my personal view is that political rallies in Kenya uh, should be banned and all candidates be put uh, to hunt their votes in the media. Now, with the new Omicron, a variant upsides, which is now uh, affecting even people who have been vaccinated. The whole population is put at risk uh, by political meetings. And I think it is only responsible that uh, anybody who wants to ask for votes uh, should do it uh, online uh, and be using media rather than uh, for public meetings. And uh, I think we should also shorten the periods of uh, campaigns. Otherwise, there's a lot of wastage of human talent and human labor. I think that uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. And I want to say this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure uh, to uh, share with you my few thoughts 
about how we should handle uh, the issue of uh, One Health. I don't think there's uh, any presentation can take uh, cognizance of all the facts that are required for One Health. But it behoves all of us to appreciate that the world we are in is highly interactive and our environment and our animals and human, us as human beings need to share the world and ensure that we live in it in health, both for our animals and ourselves, because essentially we are all interconnected. So I want to wish everybody well and God's blessings and pray that all of you remain safe. Okay, so thanks very much, uh, Professor Njenga Munene in absentia. Uh, we can give him an applaud, even if it's in a place, yes. So a number of, <clears throat> a number of critical issues that have um, uh, bearing on One Health education and capacity strengthening. Uh, of course, I cannot summarize all those, but uh, the presentation sets an excellent launchpad for our next session where we have a number of speakers who will be um, using some of this information or building on some of this information uh, to give extra perspectives. I think Professor Njenga has really narrowed down on some of the key challenges in the context of One Health uh, that we are facing. And these have a big implication on how we structure our One Health education and capacity strengthening, uh, the interconnection between uh, human environment and um, animals, and even beyond that, uh, issues of information, communication, policy, other sectors. It is a complex uh, equation, uh, if I reflect on some of the mathematics that, that we used to do. And then, of course, some important lessons which can inform uh, our One Health education and capacity strengthening agenda. So without further ado, uh, I know there are one or two questions in the chat, but let's keep those in the fridge until at a later point, since we are a bit pressed with time. So let me now um, move over to the next session where we have uh, five speakers. Um, each speaker has a topic and uh, I will implore on them uh, in the interest of time, if they can take a maximum of 10 minutes and there'll be a prize for anyone who will take less than 10 minutes, that prize shall remain. Uh, I will not mention it now, uh, but let's take a maximum of 10 minutes, uh, please, to give our presentation because after that, and then we have a very interesting uh, panel discussion and that's where we would like to engage more, all right? So for this session, we have five prese uh, presenters. I will not introduce them. Uh, as I said, uh, they are triple E, experienced, engaging, and very excited about this session. Uh, but for each one of them, as you start your presentation, just say who you are and uh, the institution you come from or what you do in less than uh, 10 seconds. Then you proceed with your presentation. So the first presenter, uh, Professor um, Oladele Ogun Satan. Uh, he is going to talk about framework for sustainable implementation of collaborative One Health. So, Professor, I hope you are online. Uh, if you are hearing me, you may confirm whether I'm audible or you are there. Professor Oladele. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. I'm sharing my screen as well. Okay. So Good afternoon to everyone. Screen. Good day. Yeah, as you share your screen, yes. just a brief introduction of yourself, and then you take the floor. And then uh, since you are a professor, I have a prize for you because I know you will take less than 10 minutes. So over to you. Thank you very much. And I will also try to be uh, brief if I can win that uh, uh, price um, for for less than ten minutes. I I will. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am Dele Ogunsetan. I'm a professor of population health and disease prevention at the University of California, Irvine, 
and I uh, direct the training and empowerment for um, the One Health Workforce Next Generation uh, project, which is uh, supported by US uh, AID. And I want to thank uh, Sam uh, Wanjohi for inviting me to this wonderful conference and my colleagues at Afrohoon all over uh, Africa have been very supportive of this uh, work. I'm expected to talk to you today about the framework for sustainable implementation and collaborative One Health, uh, particularly in education. So I will uh, cover three major topics. Uh, one is uh, the definitions of One Health uh, that demands collaboration. Uh, I think the previous speaker uh, really um, address this point in taking us through all of the uh, pandemics uh, from the last uh, century up until COVID-19 and some of the gaps in collaboration that made those pandemics uh, spread and have uh, uh, impacts beyond uh, what we could control. Then I'll talk about the strategic uh, framework describing core competencies for One Health, which is really the goal of this session. Uh, how do we decide what professionals need to know uh, when we um, uh, want to fill those gaps uh, in collaboration that prevent uh, pandemics uh, from happening and other um, uh, health uh, risks as well? And then sustainability, how do we maintain uh, the collaborations over time, especially during the periods where we do not have uh, problems such as pandemics. I think a lot of the infrastructure that we're building now may respond to COVID-19, uh, but we need to make sure that um, it, when the pandemic recedes, that we don't let things relax too much and uh, that sustainability uh, will be important. And I will talk about what we're doing uh, with the One Health Workforce Academy. So the definition uh, of One Health demands collaboration. Uh, you may all have seen uh, last week, the release of the definition of One Health by the uh, high level uh, expert panel uh, assembled by the tripartite uh, FAO, OIE, WHO, and UNEP, uh, and that definition, um, if you haven't uh, seen it, uh, really talks about an approach that mobilizes multiple sectors, disciplines, and communities, which I highlighted uh, on this slide. It is very important for us to not just take these words as mere words. How do we implement them in training and education that builds bridges across sectors, across society, and in the One Health framework of ecosystems, animals, and humans. And so in the middle of this diagram, you have communication, collaboration, coordination, capacity building. Some of these are competencies that we need to make sure that we're all aware of, but also that experts have the capacity to deliver uh, on these words as promised. An example of that collaboration is um, a very recent uh, last month, uh, my participation in the technical advisory group uh, for the tripartite One Health uh, field epidemiology training program uh, competency framework. Many, many people contributed to this effort. I am particularly proud of um, uh, working with colleagues uh, in the environment and ecosystem health sector. And I think the results of this will come uh, uh, hopefully early next year so that we can all uh, learn from it. Uh, very recently, I published uh, in the Emerging Magazine uh, at the invitation of colleagues in Indonesia, uh, their Indonesia One Health uh, University Network. And I talked about uh, uh, ensuring excellence in interprofessional skills for a competent workforce. Uh, 
I can share the link to that magazine for those who want to read, read it. But one of the things I mentioned, uh, consistent with the uh, work on COVID-19, is that the need for international collaboration and training in integrative surveillance is more pressing than ever. And integrative surveillance, in my view, is one of those gaps that we need to fill uh, with um, epidemiological uh, uh, training. Uh, I also uh, want to share with you that uh, we assembled a Delphi panel of experts across uh, many disciplines uh, and uh, professions to help us think through the next generation of One Health competencies. This was presented at the IMED uh, conference uh, that just concluded and a brief uh, summary of the presentation will be published in the International Journal of Infectious Diseases uh, in January. And I will be able to share uh, the link to those who are interested to look at the poster and hear my discussion of the disciplinary diversity and consensus uh, on the panel. Uh, and then in terms of sustainability, I mentioned that we're building a One Health Workforce Academy. We want to have an opportunity to develop a One Health certificate program based on the core competencies that come out of the Delphi panel. Uh, we have lessons on this academy. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we will eventually have a, a test uh, for uh, completion of the competencies and acquisition of the skills. And uh, this academy, we're hoping will live uh, forever uh, with trainees coming and going and employers and students uh, making sure that we have a competent workforce. Uh, there is a pathway to certification uh, clearly defined on the academy. Uh, for those who are interested, we uh, encourage you to visit and explore uh, what you can do for continuing professional development and for employers to recognize those skills. You can preview our courses and pre-enroll. Uh, they are competency-based and we're beginning to launch uh, case studies, uh, a sequence of courses. The quality uh, assurance is important and we assembled an international board of One Health examiners consisting of Afrohun and Siohun, Southeast Asian members uh, that will make sure that what we build on the academy uh, is of high quality, competency-based, and prepares uh, people for the workforce and those in the workforce can come back uh, for continuing professional development. So that's what I want to share with you. I look forward to hearing the other presentations and joining the panel uh, for further discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh... Professor Oladele, you are definitely on the prize list. So that's a good thing. Okay. So very interesting perspectives, but of course the time was short. So as you promised, uh, those will be important uh, links for people to have, for people to see what the good work you are doing. So please uh, share the links. If you can put them in the chat box, that would be, that would be excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Let's move on to the next speaker. Just to confirm, um, the next speaker is uh, Professor Mabol Nangami. Are you online? No. Not online. Uh, uh, Dr. Abuom? Okay, so... The next speaker is uh, not, um, um, not present. Online. Okay. So, yes. We'll move over to you. We are seeing, oh, that is uh, Mabel's iPhone. Okay. So, uh, the stage is yours, uh, Professor. Uh, take a few seconds to introduce yourself, and then you have the stage. And uh, the first professor has already set the precedent by being on the prize list. So, we look forward to you joining on uh, joining him on stage. So over to you, Prof. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, the opportunity to present. 
I sincerely apologize. I was rushing to, to get to a point where I would have better connectivity only to realize there was a power outage. So I'm not able to share my screen. That's why I'm on my, my iPhone, uh, just to try and uh, uh, cover for the time that uh, I've been allocated. My name is uh, Mabel Nangami. I'm an associate professor of health policy and health systems management. And I'm serving as the Dean of the School of Public Health at Moy University uh, in Kenya. We are based in Eldoret. Uh, my presentation is on uh, designing programs for sustainable and functional collaboration among animal, human, and environmental health practitioners. I'm going to uh, present in uh, two phases. First, I'll talk about the rationale and approaches and how we engaged with stakeholders to develop a curriculum uh, on MSC infectious disease and global health. And then I'll give my own reflections on implications for sustainability and uh, dynamics of uh, One Health and how we can uh, uh, grow beyond the current collaboration. The rationale for any program uh, would have to engage the stakeholders in terms of asking the following questions. How many people do we want to train and for what purpose? How do we want to train these people differently using the One Health approach? How are we going to create or intend to create a professional cadre of people who can practice One Health? What kind of support or new approaches are available for us to engage in One Health research? And finally, how are we going to create new leaders or a movement that will address One Health challenges and One Health uh, related diseases in the 21st century? There are several approaches for designing a program. And as Dele has mentioned, one approach would be to focus on short or certificate level courses where you can modify the content of your existing curricula uh, through the in-service in training. You can either mainstream or integrate various content. You can also design standalone courses or even have electives that the learners can take. What I want to address today is regarding a program level uh, program which would focus on postgraduate uh, training. This program was jointly developed by the afro Hoon Network, uh, under which uh, uh, Dr. Sam Wanjohi uh, is our country manager. Uh, and the specific institutions were Moe University and School of Public Health uh, at uh, the University of Nairobi, as well as Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. The program development, as we all know, One Health is uh, not just multidisciplinary, but transdisciplinary. Uh, it also requires multisectorial and uh, uh, approach in design and development. So in developing our program, we set out, uh, hired a consultant to first of all document the existing uh, literature and what gaps exist in terms of training needs for One Health in the country. We then held a stakeholder workshop uh, in April of 2018 to map out our own understanding as stakeholders, uh, what we really want to get out of this program. Then we held a series of workshops to develop the content between 2018 and 2019 and had a final stakeholder validation uh, meeting in July 2019 to look at the complete program. Since then, each institution, University of Nairobi, as well as Moy University, have then been pursuing through internal uh, institutional mechanisms to have the curricula approved. What did the need, what does the needs assessment uh, uh, indicate? In our curriculum, the needs assessment covered both the training uh, requirements as well as the market uh, survey. We then mapped the required competences. We mapped the required competences in terms of knowledge, skills, and behavior. 
and align them to the various disciplines, uh, looking at both human, uh, animal, as well as uh, environment. And then we looked at the competences of the graduates who are already in the field because this is a master's program and how we would be able to enhance uh, these competences or improve their performance at their various uh, workplace. And then lastly, we aligned this training needs assessment with the national as well as regional. And we also try to benchmark with the best institutions in the world by aligning our competences to the global One Health uh, competences. The program is a two-track um, curricula which focuses on infectious diseases as well as the global health component. We employed the principles of systems approach. We infused leadership and governance, entrepreneurial skills, gender, uh, data science, as well as implementation science. In looking at the syllabus, the most important thing that I want to point out is the learning outcomes, that in developing the learning outcomes of uh, any program, one needs to pay attention to the level, but also the sequencing of these uh, outcomes. In our case, we know that we are dealing with um, students from various backgrounds, uh, both in animal as well as in health, that for example, in health, there would be public health, there would be people in laboratory, there would be those from medical sciences uh, and biological sciences and so on. So we had to be careful in terms of lining up the learning outcomes to ensure that we are building from the known to the unknown, but more importantly, spiraling the learning in a way that we build the basic foundations or building blocks towards the specialization for each uh, learner. We also looked at the importance of making sure the learning objectives uh, and outcomes are measurable, understandable, attainable. This is not a very easy undertaking given the nature of One Health and the importance of uh, working across uh, different disciplines to arrive at uh, consensus. We use the Bloom's taxonomy to guide us in trying to understand the different levels, as well as the importance of trying to spiral our teaching uh, and aligning the content to the various learning outcomes. When it came to the content, um, we had to break up in various disciplines or subject matter expert uh, teams to work on the various curricula that we had uh, as or subject areas or topics that we had identified from the needs assessment and the first uh, workshop. And here each team was supposed to outline the scope as well as the level in terms of uh, uh, learning. I must say also that the content, uh, we purpose to say that about 70% of that content should lead to directly to experiential learning, uh, focusing on research, uh, given the importance of One Health. One Health is not a discipline. One Health is an approach. The other uh, aspect that I would like to mention is the collaboration in terms of the mode of delivery. This was also challenging in the way we try to structure our uh, two-tire program. Our program is, first of all, we have the common courses taken in semester one. And then the second semester of the first year, the students then go into specialization, whether they want to focus on infectious disease or want, they want to focus on global health. And then the second year of the program is uh, specific to research. The teaching methodologies, this is where we get very excited because uh, One Health requires that we are hands-on uh, so we adopted the problem-based learning approach where we are also uh, enhancing experiential learning through demo sites or field placements where students learn uh, through the interface of animal, human, and the environment such as uh, uh, Impala Ranch or going to other areas where we have the interface with wildlife uh, ecosystem. We also promote team or group-based learning uh, independent study, and also we promote use of seminars to 
for students to learn from each other. In terms of instructional material, again, the collaboration in One Health requires that we draw from different disciplines. So this is not a standard curriculum where you just pick your own area and outline the various uh, uh, core texts or the other materials that you need. So we had to again work in groups to ensure that each discipline is represented in the materials we pick and also in terms of the experiences, the practical elements, we identified the laboratories that are required, the sites that are required and mapped those to the various competences that we had identified in the course. And finally on assessment, uh, we noted that the kind of assessment required when you're applying a One Health uh, approach to your curriculum is to focus more on the practical aspect as opposed to the theoretical elements. So 70% of the assessment is um, under formative or what you call continuous assessment, field uh, placements and practicums and, uh, and so on. Uh, we also had industrial attachment where our learners would go out to about three months and work within a specific industry of their choice, depending on the specialization. So the summative, the final exam is weighted less about 30 to 40%. So to wrap up, um, program accreditation is important. And as you well know, we do not have um, uh, many international accreditation bodies within Africa or even in Kenya, we are just in the process of establishing uh, such regulatory bodies and even a policy that would help guide our capacity building uh, in the field of uh, One Health as we engage uh, with other uh, stakeholders. So structuring our program to ensure that we have self-assessment we also have assessment that takes account of uh, stakeholder needs in industry, as well as those of uh, regulators. And uh, regulation is very important because most of the professionals involved are already anchored in professional bodies uh, that would also want to know if there's any gain in uh, taking up a course like uh, the one we have developed. So it's important to also trace um, in terms of part of that accreditation, the alumni, and we have developed mechanisms of follow-up and uh, also the labor market to ensure that the competences we infuse and uh, 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 ensure that our graduates are going to perform and perform efficiently and effectively. Uh, lastly, on reflections, to be able to develop a sustainable curricula or program in One Health uh, it requires that you start off with a very clear analysis, gap analysis, uh, the training needs, and also a situation assessment because the economic, the social environment are also important, not just the academic environment. You need clear purpose and rationale and goal why you are doing this and who your target is. You need a clear roadmap on how you are going to engage as partners, as stakeholders, uh, and also map out the end process in terms of what is in it for each stakeholder uh, during admission, during training, and the placement of this graduate. Adhering to regulatory and institutional guidelines is uh, uh, very important. And finally, that partnership and networking essential for the resources you require for program. Any One Health program cannot in be implemented in one institution. We have to share resources, laboratories, uh, practicum sites, uh, demo sites and engagement. And so we need MOUs, we need a memorandum of agreement and also tap into existing networks as has been mentioned, the Africa One Health Workforce Academy that's coming up, the ECHO program series and other virtual communities of uh, practice. I would like to thank you for this opportunity for sharing what we have done in terms of developing a program that would uh, uh, use One Health approach to improve our competences in this country. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Nagami for that detailed presentation. Uh, just a comment from the Chair. It's a very interesting approach. 
And uh, myself having been uh, responsible for designing and managing programs for close to seven years, one would wonder, uh, this is all good, but how do we implement it? How do we resource them? How do we uh, create all these good things? So that is uh, some food for thought. Uh, I didn't have a chance to type it there, but something probably during the, the panel discussion, you may address that. So thanks very much. Uh, uh, I'm really running against time. So without further ado, let me invite uh, Dr. Abum, who is going to talk to us, uh, of course, with the prize in mind about uh, from theory to practice, developing shared competencies among one health practitioners at multiple levels. So uh, Dr. Abum, you're welcome. Uh, take a few seconds to tell us about yourself in terms of intro, and then you can take the stage so over to you. Good afternoon, good evening. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Tekwero Buom, and I'm from the University of Nairobi, Department of Clinical Studies, Faculty of Vet Medicine. So my talk is from theory to practice, developing shared competencies amongst One Health practitioners at multiple levels. Um, Part of what I'm going to talk about has been uh, described by, I think, the first two or three presenters. So my work is very easy, and I believe I'm going to take the prize because I'll take uh, the least amount of time. So that's the outline of my presentation. So competency is the ability to do something successfully or efficiently. And some of the important attributes uh, is the person has to demonstrate sufficient expertise. Uh, they, it also enables the organization to recruit and select staff more effectively. It also helps in evaluation of performance, uh, identifying of skills and competency gaps. It also provides for customized training and the professional development, helps for planning and especially for succession. And it also makes change management processes to work more efficiently. So we talk about the competencies and One Health. We need to think about uh, One Health professional education courses. And it's important to note that the world over, uh, they often have similar course content as well as similar expectations for learners, but they often employ multidisciplinary approaches, especially during curriculum development as has been mentioned by Professor Nangami. Uh, this often will involve the inclusion of stakeholders, such as professional and regulatory bodies, industry, alumni, and many others. If you look about at this uh, uh, from Amoguni et al. in 2018, you can see that we have the technical One Health competencies that tend to be similar across various curricula the world over. But what do we do, or what do we, what is the thought of uh, various bodies or various professionals on the non-technical competencies? I know Edna had mentioned something about, uh, in the previous presentation, about the social sciences, the gender issues, such as project management and communication. This is where we tend to have a lot of differences in the curricula, and uh, this is where we, sometimes do not lay enough emphasis, but it's very important that we do so when we're developing curricula for training different cadres. If we talk about pre-service training, uh, what we have undertaken at the university over the past few years, we've had a joint development of curricula, especially for didactic uh, courses. And I know certain uh, undergraduate programs already have one Health as a standalone course that is examinable and is also in their transcripts. We also have views of community-based education approaches to multidisciplinary groups of students. As you can see there, I don't want to talk about what Carol will come with next, but this is basically some of the things that we do. Use of simulations, and there's also joint response to One Health events, especially disease outbreaks. If we talk about in-service training, 
we have short courses, seminars, workshops, and conferences. And uh, this is just an example of a series of trainings we've been carrying out in collaboration with, uh, with One Health Echo and uh, various other partners. And of course, these help in creation of communities of practice, as well as in development of partnerships, as well as continuous professional development. We also have uh, postgraduate and diploma stroke degree programs. This is the degree program Professor Nangami was talking about, and it was a joint development between the University of Nairobi, uh, School of Public Health, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, as well as the Moy University School of Public Health and our various partners. And uh, it's part of what we envision to have for uh, in-service training so our people can end up with postgraduate degrees in One Health and related courses. So some of the challenges we've seen over the years is uh, in scheduling of joint events. For instance, when you have multiple institutions uh, working together, multiple faculties working together, we all have our timetables and schedules. So bringing multidisciplinary students to work together sometimes can be a challenge because one group is doing exams, another group has done exams and are free for training. So that has always been a challenge. There have also been challenges in funding. Uh, this of course is an ongoing concern for when it comes to most aspects of training, not just in Kenya, but the world over. The silo mentality and team building is something that is uh, not very easy to, to surmount. It's a very serious problem, but I think it's something that needs to be done. Uh, we probably during the discussion have to look at how would we do we break the silos or do we link the silos, okay? Because this is a very serious problem when it comes to development of uh, One Health and training of One Health in this country and the region. We also have issues of changing government and institutional policies and priorities. Uh, you find that, for instance, with the diminishing funding, some institutions might want to reduce the number of courses that they offer, especially if the student numbers are low. And this definitely affects the training of students and the offering of uh, different courses. And the other problem is sometimes there's expertise that isn't locally available. Uh, luckily, as we'll see later on, uh, this issue has been uh, solved for the most part by the use of digital technologies because we're now able to communicate. Unlike the pre-COVID days where we had to ship people from all over the world. These days we can have trainings online. So some of the recommendations or lessons learned is that we need to have a way of effecting culture change because this is what will help different professions to work together and in the formation of One Health teams. We also need to inbuild sustainability in our training programs at all levels, whether it's at uh, primary school, secondary school, tertiary uh, education, we need to build sustainability because if any program or any activity is not sustainable, then of course it will die off once the donor leaves. We also need to work as multiple institutions so that we take advantage of the expertise. So if the expertise is not available at the University of Nairobi, but we have it at Moi University, who have been our partners for many years, then it is very easy for us to get this expertise and share it and uh, use it to enhance One Health training in the country and the region. There's also South to South collaboration. And this is also something that is very possible. We need to, as much as possible, try to also use the expertise available in the region. And uh, this also makes it more affordable when you want to have face-to-face uh, -face training, but of course, online training now also helps to enhance this. We also need to have ways of influencing policy on training, and this can only be done by having high quality research, sorry for the spelling error. So high quality research would help to enhance this, and also the dissemination of findings to all relevant 
stakeholders. So this would help us to influence policy and uh, talk to government, talk to the people who hold the money and ask them to assist us in training some of these. So one health competency development at all levels is key for workforce growth in this dynamic world with emerging threats as had been mentioned by Professor Jenga Munene. And uh, my last slide is just references and I say thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, definitely a prize for the time and uh, very interesting perspectives. Again, uh, just from the chair's perspective and building on uh, my experience designing programs in a university network. Uh, this is not for you, but again, it's food for thought for the panel. This can be addressed during the panel. So I, will, I often wonder what one of the challenges I experienced is um, framing it in terms of a question. How easy is it or how challenging is it for institutional structures, frameworks, and policies to embrace these nice requirements we are talking about uh, regarding one health education and capacity strengthening? Because those are the challenges that we, we, we do face often. So some food for thought, probably the panel members will uh, address that. So thank you very much. Moving forward, the next uh, presentation uh, on our schedule is from uh, Ms. Caroline uh, Kimani. You are here, right? Yes, so welcome. We are glad to have you in person and even more glad to listen to a social ecologist talking about One Health Matters. So this is really important for us. Uh, and I would even die to give you an extra minute just to listen to your presentation, all right? Yes, yes and the prize, of course. So please, the stage is yours. Uh, introduce yourself uh, briefly, and then let's listen to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Caroline Kimani. I am an alumnus of the One Health uh, training demo sites. Thank you. <laughs> um, I am also a postgraduate student at the University of Nairobi, uh, taking MSc in range management. And I am glad to present to you my experiences learning and working in the One Health framework. Thank you. So um, let me just start by saying that as a child, I, my dream was to become a neurosurgeon. So clearly that didn't happen because you can see I'm in sociology, um, but One Health has brought me close enough. <laughs> so um, I'm grateful for that. Anyway, um, so up until the One Health training demo site, the demo site is a, a training, a pre-workforce training where students um, are trained for one week in theory, and then there's a field uh, training for a couple of three or so weeks. And up until then, I thought um, One Health was a preserve of vets, yeah? And it was not until uh, from the members of the students One Health uh, Innovations Club that I learned um, that I, was, I could apply for the demo site training. And so I jumped at the opportunity. And um, I was privileged to be among the pre-workforce uh, trainees. And the demo site happened in uh, Southern Kenya, in uh, the Amboseli ecosystem. And uh, uh, as you can see, some of the trainings we went through was one um, participatory approaches. And what you see there is uh, a lot of community engagement, uh, which started with stakeholder mapping, and uh, just a needs assessment of community challenges uh, through tools such as proportional piling and uh, prioritizing the needs of the community as uh, presented by them. And we were a very diverse range of professions in the training, which also opened my mind to uh, how interconnected we are. And it is clear that you can always point uh, to any challenge there is globally. You can always point the problem of a lack of multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary approach. 
And so One Health really brought me to break in uh, the perspective of being a, a hard ecologist with no interactions from other professions. And also just the role of social ecology in, in One Health or in the health sector. So yes, we identified uh, needs and then we uh, together also with the community, we prioritized, identified uh, possible interventions and also means in which to address some of those, uh, some of those uh, challenges brought forward. And uh, a couple of them were like human wildlife conflicts, um, diseases such as uh, diarrhea. And uh, in, our, in our community, we prioritized uh, uh, diarrheal diseases um, because of open defecation. After doing a root cause analysis, it was identified that uh, uh, open defecation was the priority challenge. And therefore we came up with uh, community outreach programs to just educate the community on, uh, on healthier practices. And um, as you can see from the images, uh, this was uh, some of the, um, just some of the tools I would say we used to, to bring the message to the community. Uh, what you see in the first image is, uh, is a skit uh, just explaining to the community how uh, these diseases would spread. And the second is how the, the cycle of pathogens in diarrheal mm. diseases um, and as you can see, the community were really interested and fascinated by uh, just the images we were showing them. And it was also a really eye-opening uh, experience for each one of us. So the, the one sitting in a court is a nurse, and the one, I am in pink, and the one holding uh, me is a public health uh, practitioner, yes. And uh, we were able to, through various platforms um, just spread or share information or the trainings we had gathered through the demo site experience. And one is a nurses, uh, the International Nurses Conference in 2019. Um, and also we're able to share to an audience of young people uh, through TV, um, just share uh, on the One Health approaches and zoonotic diseases and the interplay and interlinkages of all the, all the professions when it comes to health challenges. And it was pretty interesting. I mean, I never thought I would be able to attend a nurse, nurses conference. And they were also really um, fascinated to have an ecologist. And uh, some of the key lessons, um, the multidisciplinary approach and the need to have various uh, professions in, uh, in carrying out community interventions. And this has, the learnings from the demo site have been crucial for me. Um, it is through also the demo site experience that I developed my concept for my master's research pro project. And uh, I came up with the research on human elephant conflicts. And I also carried it out in the same place where we had the demo site. So the networks there were really important. And uh, through that, I was also able to get a grant. And uh, later, I am still, I'm still um, in touch with the various uh, professions that I was able to come into contact with. So it has also taught me to, uh, to, to develop a wide network of professions and not just in ecology or environment and whatnot. Um, a key lesson was also systems thinking, taking a systems approach uh, to every challenge and not just um, like in my case, not just think the environmental way and so on, but to, to, th to think really not just in parts, but in systems and uh, also how interconnected we are and I don't think this, this uh, can be emphasized anymore, especially with the COVID. Uh, I think we have all seen how interconnected we are. And uh, yes, sharing information freely uh, between various professions and breaking silos was also a key lesson. 
And this was some of the eco health challenges which I've seen have um, been mentioned. And these are, these are great uh, global crises of our times, like biodiversity loss, uh, land use, um, wildlife habitat encroachment, climate change, food systems. It is, uh, it is important for One Health to continually keep aligning to uh, these environmental challenges. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude with uh, a quote from the Earth Charter, which I think is, which I personally love, and I think reminds me of also One Health, that we stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future as the world becomes increasingly interdependent and fragile, and the future at once holds great peril and great promise. I don't think there has ever been a more um, appropriate time when one health approaches should be implemented than now. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Caroline, for that uh, brief and sharp presentation. Uh, you may be happy to know that I was once in the department where you were, but that was way back in the 80s. So it's good to know that uh, we still have some seeds coming out of that department. Uh, coming from a social ecologist, I think that was a different kind of presentation, but connecting very well some of the key issues we are talking about regarding uh, One Health. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, last but not least at all, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Margaret Karembu, who is going to talk to us, to us uh, about science communication as an enabler of One Health culture and practice. Uh, Margaret, uh, it's over to you. Uh, take a few seconds to introduce yourself. And then uh, you have uh, about 10 minutes to make your presentation. Uh, the prize is still there. So over to you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wellington, for this opportunity and greetings to you all, wherever, wherever you are listening from. My name is Margaret Karembu. I work for ISA, AfriCenter, which is one of the hosted institutions in Ilri. My training is in env environmental science, but my practice is science communication, which, like my predecessors, Kathy, Helen, and others, have said they came into areas that they had not trained for, but they had they have developed passion for. So let me say I have great passion for science communication. Let me also thank Ilri and partners for this opportunity and the partnership we have had over the last more than two decades that Ilri has hosted us at the beautiful Ilri campus. So I'm going to take you through uh, science communication as an enabler of One Health culture and practice. And just to start us with, I, I noted from the participants that uh, we have very few medics, fewer medics or human medics. And so I thought of giving just one example to demonstrate what it is and what we mean by ensuring that we incorporate all of us. So I have this, um, this slide, it's, it's a real life, life experience where I was with my daughter in a social function and Sitting, we were sitting next to a politician. And when we were introducing ourselves, she's a dental surgeon. And she mentioned that, um, you know, she does a lot of root canals. So the politician said, oh, you know, the doctor asked me to report next week for a root canal. Can you explain to me what does it entail? So my good dear daughter said, it requires just three simple steps, three simple procedures. The first one is extirpation. The second one is chemomechanical preparation. And finally, we do obturation. So the politician was just left based and was wondering what all these terminologies were all about. But of course, to professionals in that field, that is really how you explain root canal among your peers. So looking at uh, this, actually led to one of the Nobel rates uh, in the early 1925, Bernard Shaw to proclaim 
that the, big, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And indeed, what we have seen over time, the common practice has been that communication is almost an, usually an afterthought. We confuse science communication with corporate or public relations communications. There is this notion that one size fits it all. And so once you develop a communication plan, it should fit across sectors. Then uh, as I review some of the publications that uh, scientists and researchers work on, uh, most of the times when they're asked about communication, how they communicate their findings, they say they will do a journal publication. Good, but that does not go beyond your peers. Then of course, we need to differentiate between information and communication, and these two are not the same. So then what is science communication? So here we are, we have the scientists or the researcher, and this applies to both social scientists and natural scientists. And then we have this big crowd here, which is made of the public, but remember, there is no audience like a public. And so when it comes to One Health, we'll be confronted with engaging with this multitude of players or actors in the One Health system, and all will require different uh, approaches. And so we talk about science communication, about, about putting research into context by helping stakeholders understand research results and make informed evidence-based decisions. So in a nutshell, science communication strengthens the connection between science and society or between research, researchers and society. It also helps build confidence about scientific information. And one key message about what science communication is all about and our role as researchers is that we have an obligation to communicate our work. It is not the job of others to do that. But then we have this big communication challenge when it comes to the, to the One Health. And just again to demonstrate why it is so important to put communication into context, there is this uh, conference that happened a while back, it was a UN conference, and the moderator just asked what we thought was a very simple question. What, in your opinion, what is your opinion about food shortage in the rest of the world? And of course, there were uh, people from the Middle East, the Americas, the Europeans, and the Africans. And then one, the, the Arab asked what opinion means. The Americas asked what the rest of the world means. Then Europe asked what shortage means, and then Africa, I'm sorry to use that. Uh, this was really, I could not edit it because it was a cartoon that was put up out there. Yes, what does food mean? And we know for sure, this is the challenge that we have with the One Health, that we have diverse cultures and disciplines. We have from yesterday talked about the multidisciplinary, the transdisciplinary nature of One Health, varied interests and needs, inability to simplify technical research findings, and we have a lot of jargon and acronyms. As I was listening from yesterday, I have a whole range of acronyms, AMR, uh, we have uh, toxicity, we have epidemiology, we have pathogens, and all these mean different, uh, have different meanings for different uh, groups. And then of course, we have the gender insensitivity in messaging, as Helen mentioned very clearly. And so we say, Context will determine how messages are received. So if you're not careful about uh, or you're sensitive about this big gap of communication, then we are not likely to do communication at all. It will just be an illusion. So what are some of the key watchers that I wanted to share with you this uh, evening? Uh, we have realized that there are three key gaps among many. There is the language gap when it comes to One Health. There's the communication gap. And then there's the silo mentality. My predecessors in this session have just re-emphasized about this silo mentality. So looking at the communication gap, you know, in the African uh, wisdom, we always know that uh, words are responsible for cutting down a tree. The act is only an instrument. So what we need to do is to ensure we get the relevance of our communication. There is what we want to say, and there is also what our audiences are interested in. And to do that, we need to develop our soft skills training among the researchers and the OH partners, including risk communication and very, very importantly, storytelling about 
our work, about the, our audiences, about the, those who receive our, our interventions. And we need to increase social media and conventional media engagement to enhance OH visibility and also to influence policy because our policymakers will mainly get information about One Health from the media. Also, if as researchers we are not there or as actors, then they get the wrong information. Now, one of the other big challenges about uh, the silo mentality is about addressing the overlapping mandates between the different ministries, between the various disciplines. So we have the ministries of agriculture, health, we have finance, we have environment. And if we don't do that through the, the, the houses that make laws, like the parliamentary sessions, then we are not likely to get to become these uh, overlapping mandates and so we will not be able to close this communication gap. Then the other major challenge is the, major, the challenge of the language, the language gap. And this is really to do with what, how scientists or technical experts and non-technical experts think or uh, contextualize communications. For scientists, we start with technical theory, collecting data, and then we come to the conclusion. But if you're going beyond your comfort zone to communicate with people who are not in your discipline, like you're going to do in One Health, we need to be wary that most of the times, non-technical people who are not in your area are interested in the bottom line. What is it? That, what is the conclusion? How does this intervention align with the One Health goals? Then, of course, you can go to the rest of the story, you can go to the background and so on, but you have only a few minutes to communicate that. So scientists, you start with the context, historical context, the public wants to know the bottom line of what we call the so what. Then the, so one of the golden rules is to really make sure that we simplify our language, we unpack or become conscious of the technical jargon and acronyms we use in our disciplines so that we can be able to reach out to people who are not within our main domain or our main area of operation. So we have uh, this, uh, sometimes scientists are accused, but even the social scientists, they also have jargon, elasticity, we have recession. All these mean differently for the scientific, for, for the natural scientists. And then uh, finally, uh, my, my, my other fact that uh, we have seen is what we have belabored uh, this afternoon and yesterday that really we need to break this uh, insulation or silo mentality. And this is because, again, if you want to go fast with the implementation of One Health, we need to really go together. And some of the proposed interventions, among many, we need to do a lot of uh, stakeholder net mapping, going beyond stakeholder analysis to understand the relationships and connections of the actors so that our messages will be based on the kind of connections that the OH actors are having within an ecosystem. We also need to identify the key territorial issues so that, uh, again, we identify these shared values so that we are able to communicate better. Then increase engagement across OH sectors to address conflicts and appropriate platforms are so key because again, if you don't communicate using the appropriate key uh, platforms, then you'll not be able to reach out. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, we need to understand relationships among OH actors for message context. That is the most important because if message is out of context, then even the interventions will not be uh, taken up. Then we, we need to show integrity and shared values that align with the OH actors. Very, very importantly, we need to simplify language and jointly develop a One Health glossary of terminologies and acronyms. I'm not sure if uh, the players have, the actors have already started doing this, but I did see a paper recently from the One Health European Union joint program where they have actually developed a very uh, con uh, concise glossary so that we get to understand the, and interpret the messages in a more harmonized way. Then we need to work with the media and policymakers right from the onset. Let us not wait until we have an intervention to bring the media. Let's work with them together. Let's build their capacity. Then we also need to be more proactive than reactive in order to build trust. For indeed, people want to know that you care before they care about what you know. And with that, I say Asante Sana, I'm looking forward to the discussion and just getting to know how best we build healthy people 
healthy environment and healthy animals through the One Health approach. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Margaret, for that uh, brief uh, presentation. Uh, I know this uh, presentation takes almost an hour under normal circumstances, but you have done well to summarize it and to hammer the main uh, points. Uh, on your behalf, let me just comment that the, uh, the cartoon you used is uh, basically for satire purposes. Uh, is not the real situation. So we normally clarify that when you're using that cartoon so that people don't misinterpret. Uh, let me say that on your behalf as chair. So thanks very much. Uh, so at this point, I'll invite Nicholas for a few minutes to deal with the main tea. In the meantime, uh, the presenters, please get ready for the panel discussion. Uh, it's going to be exciting. So you will get pinned on the screen. But before that, Nicholas, you're welcome for the uh, mentee so that we prepare for the panel discussion. So over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Wellington, for running the session and also for our speakers for today's session. So many surprises, especially for non-scientists, you'd say. Great. Now we are going to hear from you and how your thoughts are evolving based on attending this conference. <clears throat> and we'd love to know your thoughts, especially on how, based on what has been shared today, how can we bring down the silos? Because this is normally what normally comes up when discussing One Health, how can we, bring down the silos, cooperate more, collaborate more. So, and the mentee code remains the same. Let's see how. Yep, so people are saying engage more. We change the mindset and we communicate better, joint activities, teamwork. We deliberately engage, yeah. Reduce conflicts among the among the disciplines. We collaborate more. So let's see how far we are doing. We're having 20, 20 responses. Yeah. But the message across Wellington is that people are asking for more collaboration, more engagement among the various disciplines. So I think the message is coming across. So maybe from there, I'll hand it over to you for panel discussion, and then we can hear more questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. So let me welcome our presenters uh, for this afternoon for a panel discussion. And from the program, as you can see, we want to dive deep into strategies for developing, implementing, and sustaining One Health education in our higher learning institutions. Uh, I don't know whether we're able to see our panelists. Uh, you are uh, five, I think. Yes. So let me welcome you on board. Uh, and let me thank you for the exciting and thought-provoking presentations that you have just made. This is highly appreciated on behalf of all participants. So we now have an opportunity to engage you or for you to explain further and dive deeper into the discussions engage uh, through this panel discussion. Let me just quickly explain how it's structured so that I don't get you by surprise. So we'll start off by setting the scene by a bit of uh, what I call cross-fertilization of ideas and uh, perspectives. And just giving you an opportunity to give a comment or add a point to someone else's presentation for clarity. And that should take a very short time. Uh, and then uh, we will go to specific questions. Uh, I have some specific questions which I'll be asking you to comment on or to give some perspectives on. And then of course, we'll go to a wrap up. And in the wrap up, I will be asking you to give us your take home message 
what is your take home message and who should be listening to that message so i think that gives you a bit of um, what uh, to expect so let's start it off let's cross fertilize our ideas i want to invite uh, any of you in any order uh, to take uh, half a minute just to comment or give an additional perspective uh, to any of the presentations that your colleagues uh, your colleagues gave. Uh, I don't know whether you'd like me to mention names, but if you are ready, just unmute and uh, and go ahead. Um, my name is Mabel. I, I just wanted to add to the presentations that have been made that uh, one, one thing for us to really sustain uh, collaborations around One Health, we have to take on board the fact that it's not a short term uh, or a bullet uh, magic that we, we are aiming for. To build a trust and uh, uh, across the partners or amongst partners, across various sectors and to meaningfully engage takes time. So my point is that it is, uh, we are in it for the long haul and we should expect that uh, this will be also an expensive undertaking, that it's not cheap to, to find the uh, opportunities to break these silos and the persistence uh, will also help um, uh, at least nurture that, that team spirit uh, to break down the silos that uh, we tend to experience over time. Uh, okay. The un undoing is that uh, at times we give it a try and then we say it's not working. We are too quick to, to give up. So that's my perspective. Thank you. Yeah, so it doesn't come easy, it takes time, it needs patience and persistence. And, and sometimes uh, you have to put in a lot of your personal energy and a lot of focus. Uh, so it's not that easy. Cool. Uh, anyone yeah. else? I yes, can please. go next. Thank Half thank a minute. You. Half a minute. Yes, yes. Very quickly. Thank you. So um, cats are notoriously independent animals. But somebody once said, if you want to herd cats, you have to move the food. And I think the collaboration that we seek requires that we reward collaborations in, instead of independent performance. This has to change in academic departments and schools where veterinary medicine and human medicine and environmental science and the social sciences are rewarded for performing within their disciplines. And it's very difficult to judge collaboration across disciplines, but we have to recognize that as a one health imperative uh, mm -hmm. and do it not just for faculty, but in service professionals and, uh, and not sure that in our students. Thank you. Okay, so some new homework, new ways of doing things, new ways of looking at uh, systems and new ways of looking at uh, performance and all that within our institutions. All right, good. Yeah, I want um, to come in. Yes, Margaret. Yeah, thank you. Just a very quick one to add on that, um, you know, uh, the, the, the longest journey starts with a step and the step that uh, we have to start making is uh, in our institutions, because this is where we have the young people, we have very large uh, groups of students and we can change culture and practice when they are coming into the university. So if we can have, we can purpose to have a day where the disciplines, you know, the, the health sciences meet up with the agricultural scientists. The agricultural scientists meet up with the School of Journalism because we have seen that even within the universities, we have talent in who can help us in communication, but we never meet. So if we can purpose to do that so that two or three disciplines get a day where they meet up and thrash out some of the issues, especially in One Health, I think that that will make a big difference. And within the four or five years when uh, these, these uh, students are in the universities and beyond, then they'll have started bonding together and then they go out now to various institutions, then they already have that culture, they already have that collaborative spirit. Thank you. Yeah, it's very true. And I remember in one of the workshops uh, we had some time back uh, with students and uh, scientists and lecturers, the students actually were asking uh, in this conference or in this workshop, 
how come we don't have people from discipline X and faculty this and that, and yet you are telling us we are supposed to, you know, to act in this way. So it's a challenge. We talk about these things, but then we have to reflect back and see exactly how we do it, where we start, and where we have to end. Okay, very well put. So moving on, uh, let's move on to the individual uh, questions. Uh, so yesterday, uh, I think one of the issues that came up, uh, somebody said that uh, they took a course in designing interdisciplinary research. And they think that that was more useful or more helpful in thinking about One Health than a second course that was actually about One Health. All right. So I wonder, Prof Nangami, what would be your, your gut feeling about this? How would you respond to this? What do you think about this? That actually taking a course in designing interdisciplinary research, somebody say that they found that more useful than an individual course uh, about One Health. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I, I, although I didn't attend yesterday's, but uh, I can uh, appropriately respond to this question. Um, it's true, when you think of One Health, uh, it is an approach, it's not a discipline. So at times we tend to put a lot of emphasis on uh, designing separate courses that, uh, uh, and even at university we are challenged whether this has enough theory in it to stand alone as a, as a course. So to me, that question uh, directs our attention to always think that one, remember that One Health is an approach and this approach can best demonst be demonstrated through the practice. Uh, and part of the practice in academia is the research uh, that we are trying to, to at least grow as a, an area so that we, you know, nurture the other aspects or principles of uh, yeah, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, the interconnectedness uh, that we, we desire to see. So yes, it is true, but uh, learning the approach alone without the theoretical background can also create another gap in terms of comprehension and application of the knowledge. So I would say that going forward, we need to balance, uh, depending on your background, we need to balance the two. So if you are from a social background and you've not engaged in any of the science fields, there's a strong recommendation that you need the theoretical foundations in some of those areas, not the technical aspects, but just that for understanding to be able to meaningfully uh, apply, but also yeah. if you are you are well versed in uh, in some of the areas, uh, depending on your earlier degree, then that uh, application through research uh, is uh, worth it in terms of uh, then focusing on another theoretical course that would bring you the foundations of either microbiology or whatever it is that may be necessary. Thank you. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> Uh, Professor Oladele, I think you presented a very comprehensive approach, highlighting some of the things you are doing within your program. Uh, I wonder, putting all that into perspective, what would be your response to this or your comment uh, on that particular observation by the participant yesterday? Uh, half a minute, please. Thank you. Um, I think when we speak about uh, an approach that needs to be demonstrated. Um, the importance of One Health is to prepare us uh, effectively, and we can't wait till an emergency situation happens for people to figure out how to communicate, for example, or how to uh, talk to um, uh, surveillance teams in animal sector or human sector or environmental sector. So it is an approach, but it still needs that competency to be acquired and uh, verified and uh, delivered on demand. And that's why the education is so important in addition to the technical skills, of course. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, moving on, let me turn to Dr. Abum, right? what we have been listening to and all these good perspectives and uh, successes, lessons learned, uh, what we are doing, what we are planning. One would ask, uh, is One Health marketable? Is One Health marketable? 
Uh, and how can we foresight its value and embed findings in the curricula? The last part. Uh, so is one health marketable? Yes. That is the first bit of it. And how can we foresight its value mm -hmm. and embed the findings in curricula? So <clears throat> thank you very much for that. I'd like to say One Health is uh, marketable. If you look at uh, the various areas in One Health that uh, need to be need to be to be tackled, then we'd see that it's a very wide concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the different uh, engagements we've had with stakeholders, including needs assessment, we find that uh, many people really want to undertake this program. And I think that was part of the justification for development of the curriculum in infectious disease and global health. So the market survey shows that there are multiple people who want to undertake the course and they're from multiple disciplines. And it is for that reason why when we are developing uh, the curriculum, which, uh, we, which we spoke about earlier in the presentations uh, by Professor Mabel and I, you find that it's a curriculum that's open to all professions so that we can have the multidisciplinary groups of people trained in uh, One Health uh, principles. And uh, we can also have an opportunity to develop workforce that are ready to respond to One Health challenges. If the second question was about uh, foresight in its value, I think it's important that we look at it in terms of, um, as I said again, the workforce. How much workforce do you require to respond to these uh, emerging threats, uh, not just infectious disease, but also climate change and uh, several other factors. So it is a discipline that uh, definitely needs to be enhanced. But then we also need to be careful not to have uh, a program that creates uh, generalists, if I can use that term, or one that can uh, create uh, opportunity for quacks to join uh, certain professions. But it's something that uh, when we engage with the regulatory authorities, then we're able to curtail that and prevent that from occurring. So that's what mm -hmm. I'd say. Thank you. All right, so, so I think in your answer, you mentioned uh, a number of things, uh, which to me give me a bit of thin lines between a number of perspectives or a number of issues, uh, regulatory authorities and, uh, you know, generalists and that kind of thing. So it makes me wonder, so how, how is this structured? How is the One Health you know, training structured, what is it targeting or who is it targeting and how do you define marketability? Just wondering in my, how do you define that? Okay, that's and a, any of the panelists can also jump in just yeah. for sake of clarity, yes. Yeah, that's an interesting question because I'm not an expert in marketing. So I'd like to add uh, throw marketability to the rest of my panelists. But as you say, okay. uh, the value of having the regulatory bodies on board whenever you're developing any curricula is that it enables it to be to have a, a robust control mechanism for the students who are actually undertaking the course and it also helps to improve marketability because they know for instance uh, I think we're having a situation currently between uh, the TSC and the graduate teachers mm -hmm. so the TSC I assume is a regulatory authority and we have the graduate teachers and they're having these issues when it comes to promotions. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have regulatory authorities on board during the curriculum development process, you find that whoever is um, graduating from the course, uh, for instance, if he's registered by the veterinary board, by the medical and dentist practitioners uh, board, they are already, it's a degree program that is acceptable to them. So when this person graduates, he has opportunities for career development within his profession, mm -hmm. and that definitely enhances the marketability. And for us, we look at it in terms of workforce that is available to respond. Because if you have workforce who are available, but they're not marketable in their profession, very few people would want to 
join that actual course. So it's a win-win for us. Thank you. So marketability, I'll throw it to mm -hmm. the rest of the panelists. Okay, I'm sure the one or two panelists are thinking about that. But in the meantime, uh, uh, Caroline, given the path you have walked, do you have do you have a comment that is itching in that perspective that you would like to contribute at this moment? Less than a minute. Um, thank you. Um, I think in my case, I would I would just put forward or recommend uh, engagement of alumni from the one held uh, workforce trainings, pre workforce mm -hmm. trainings. And uh, I think there's a wealth of, uh, of potential you can tap into using them as One Health ambassadors and also to mainstream One Health, which will, will benefit very many sectors at, mm -hmm. uh, at all levels. Yes, okay. thank you. And also motivate uh, the environment uh, professions more into One Health. Thank you. Okay. So over to the other panelists, uh, the issue of uh, marketability. Anybody with a, uh, would like to give uh, yeah, I, some I intervention? Yeah, I can jump in quickly. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So um, I did put a link to the chat uh, for a stakeholder survey for the One Health Workforce Academy that we are conducting. We've had hundreds of responses so far, but everybody is welcome to share their Point. And we have questions about this um, marketability. Uh, One Health has to add value to employers. Uh, the question is, why would I, as a you know, minister of health or nonprofit organization, charge with protecting uh, public health and global health security? Why would I want somebody who's trained in One Health than simply hiring a public health, a master's in public health or a physician or vet uh, or, or social scientist. I think, you know, the employers have to show uh, us, the trainers, that uh, they need people who are ready to hit the ground running uh, without additional training when um, we have spillover events. And it's not easy to do that in a single discipline. So having the experience of working together, learning the skills of collaboration and partnerships and communication and the kind of transdisciplinary surveillance research uh, is not something, as I previously mentioned, that you learn very quickly at the time of crisis. So I think that when we have a lot of trained One Health graduates in employment and the employers reward them uh, and put them in positions of authority and decision-making, then we would have succeeded in demonstrating the marketability of One Health. Our survey results so far show that employers want this kind of training, but they are not yet sure how to reward those who are trained beyond those who are uh, mm -hmm. independent, you know, it's more independently uh, trained uh, in single disciplines. So we need to match the training with the reward system uh, at the employment sector. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Fair and Knife. Quite complex, and it's good you shared the link with some of the studies that you have conducted and the findings that you have so far. That will be useful to, to our participants. Now, turning over to, to Margaret. Uh, and this is something you have been talking about for a while. Now, looking at One Health and what we are discussing uh, since yesterday, one would ask or one would wonder, how easy is it for institutional structures, frameworks, and policies to embrace these nice requirements for One Health education and, and, and practice? How, how practical or how easy is it? What is your experience in this? Thank you. I would say that uh, it is not that easy because uh, we have this very strong, strongly held beliefs and mindsets. Everybody is sticking to their own territory. And so anytime you try to encroach, you know, people feel like you are encroaching into somebody else's uh, territory. And so uh, one of the things that uh, we also need to really equip 
uh, those who are getting into implementation of One Health is on is soft skills, you know, soft skills of negotiating, conflict management, just managing expectations. Because uh, once you get into the system and you challenge the status quo, then uh, people all of a sudden become very hostile to you. So I would say we really need those soft skills so that you can be able to manage some of these uh, conflicts that are going to happen when you get to talk to a policymaker in health and why he should allocate a uh, budget, not just to the human health uh, component, but also to share that budget with somebody from the environmental field, because then it means you are reaching or you are arriving at one goal of ensuring one health. All right. Uh, what about um, Dr. Rabuom? You talked about your program uh, and the nice work that you are doing, all these uh, good proposals. How easy was it or difficult was it to deal with the policy side of things, different faculties and the people in their institutional policies? How easy was was it or how difficult was it and what did you do? Oh, thank you very much. Um, this is uh, something we did in conjunction. I can see Professor Nangami uh, on the other side. But as you're saying, it wasn't easy trying to work with uh, the many professions who are involved in uh, One Health. And um, first of all, there are issues of uh, funding and we were lucky to get uh, support from a partner who was able to, to fund the whole exercise. We also got uh, expertise from our, our partner universities. Most of them are from the US and uh, this definitely helped to, to ease in the burden of developing the program. Um, we also had to look at uh, our institutions because as we keep saying, we all have uh, our mindsets and uh, trying to change uh, certain, uh, I don't know what term to use, certain uh, entrenched uh, principles, uh, trying to, to tell, for instance, uh, someone who's been working in microbiology for many years or public health, that is soon going to, to get uh, graduates from, uh, from journalism, for instance, uh, it's not easy. So trying to change that mindset was definitely a challenge, but we are lucky that uh, through several uh, workshops and engagements we had with faculty, as well as with various partners, were able to, to convince them that uh, this is the way to go. The world is changing. Uh, the term health professional is a term that is quite fluid and we need to accept that for instance, someone who is a specialist in health economics is also a health professional. So we really need to change our mindsets, change the way we think. Uh, some of, someone had asked a question whereby he had mentioned that are we breaking silos or uh, building bridges? We need to actually find ways of uh, linking the silos or breaking them as we always say, because it is these silos that lead to uh, these uh, emergence of these One Health challenges, because we can no longer rely on one profession to protect the whole world from challenge X or challenge Y. We need uh, to adopt these multidisciplinary approaches, and therefore we need to have multidisciplinary uh, One Health specialists out there who are ready to work together and manage these complex uh, challenges that we have out there. Uh, probably I'd ask uh, Professor Nangami to add a few more comments on this because we're working on this together with her. Yeah, in one minute. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Abo. Yes, um, getting into the policy space is, is a very tricky issue. It touches matters of uh, governance and uh, effective leadership to be able to navigate this change that we are seeking within institutions, but also beyond that, the, the policy network uh, within the, the at government level. So yes, it's true that within more university, for example, any other university, one thing that we don't have is uh, adequate policies to address some of these needs that we are more, uh, discussing. And I'll give an example. For example, when you hire a lecturer in a university, 
you are expected to demonstrate your own professional competences. If you are a medical doctor, they expect that you'll be working in a clinic as well as teaching the students. If you are a sociologist, you do expect to be publishing in a journal of sociology and not all this cross-cutting, cross -cutting, multidisciplinary and so on. If you rise the career ladder to be a professor, you are expected again to profess in your own discipline. So until we have policies that properly recognize that multidisciplinary approach, give it its importance and place within universities, it will still continue to, to challenge us. Um, the other aspect about uh, university policies or institutional policies is the admission aspect. We struggled with this, but luckily in Kenya, we have the Kenya University Placement Board. So once you specify the minimum requirements uh, within a curriculum, that is feasible. But again, it speaks to how can you have an art, somebody with an arts background going to do a science-based program and so on. So it's the issue of both mindset at individual level, but also the policy support, the governance that will then lead to allocation of adequate resources to be able to effectively address this. We need to okay. probably lobby. Uh, lobbying is one thing that we need to, and you can't lobby empty-handed. We need evidence where we have proven that One Health works to market to our policymakers, decision makers to be able to effect this change. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, quite some homework uh, uh, to accomplish uh, before we can make uh, great leaps in terms of process. So moving away from that and uh, not to ambush the director of uh, vet services in Narok, uh, who is my friend, I talked to him yesterday. I would like to request you, listening to all this uh, as, um, as a government official, somebody who receives uh, these graduates and uh, somebody who manages uh, lots of structures and policies downstream. Uh, what is your comment? What is your gut feeling about uh, this discussion about you know one health education uh, and how to get those competent graduates uh, coming on your side and how do they fit in? Uh, is there do you have a comment on this or some advice? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I feel, I personally feel that this is a very, very critical uh, aspect and approach to health uh, delivery. That's why I am really here for all the three days. So I can listen in and get the most that I can from the presenters and all the uh, members present. So um, it, is, it is actually very critical that we have uh trainees and graduates uh getting this one health uh, approach in their in their learning and even uh to have some aspect of uh, actual implementation so i think it is very important that we bring in the end we have to bring everybody to the same understanding in all the disciplines that are concerned so that we can begin uh, the journey together. And uh, we actually on the ground feel that there's some, there's some resistance from uh, certain aspects. And this is just about attitudes. Mm -hmm. So we would in the end have to change these attitudes beginning from our trainees. And, uh, and although we say that it's not easy to teach an old dog new tricks, but we may try and, uh, and see how far we can go. It is, mm -hmm. it is very, very uh, critical. We have these experiences in various uh, aspects. Obviously, very easily in the area of zoonotic uh, diseases, <laughs> but we have the same experiences in food uh, safety. So we have this um, uh, feeling that there are some gaps that can only be filled if we are working together and working together. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. But uh, just a quick uh, follow up from your side of the story or from your side of the experience, uh, looking at uh, institutional aspects, structures and policies, how is it, how easy is it to absorb this, uh, the, the, the people we train, you know, when they come as uh, people who are uh, in one health, in one minute? Uh, definitely. Uh, in the government system, once you have uh, approved uh, trainings, 
the equally developed uh, schemes of, of, of service mm -hmm. for, for such uh, trainees. So uh, definitely as, as curricula develop, there must be a sensitization in government that there's these, these people that have this shared knowledge and we need to develop uh, new schemes because it is these schemes that separate the various uh, careers in government. And they're the ones that build the, uh, the walls in service uh, delivery or in working together to deliver uh, services. So if, if we work together right from development of curricula to development of schemes, then it will be seamless when sending these people to, to, to the public service. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much for uh, coming in uh, very quickly to give those perspectives. Uh, almost the last question as we draw towards your wrap up uh, panelists. So very quickly, I would like uh, each one of you to just to highlight two key skills you think uh, are very uh, necessary for us to grow in our next generation, one health workforce. What are those two key skills that you feel are really critical? Let's start with uh, uh, Professor Oladele. What are those two key Thank skills you. you think they are very critical? Yeah. Thank you. I put in the chat uh, one of the outcomes of our international uh, Delphi panel on uh, One Health competencies. One mm -hmm. that came out um, uh, strongly is implementation science. And the second is translational science. These are uh, terms that are used uh, primarily in the health sciences to show that scientific knowledge that's published in the journals uh, are not the end of the story. We need to make them into solutions that are sustainable. Mm -hmm. So implementation science uh, really affects how we, trans how we make knowledge relevant to local situations. Uh, something that okay. works in the United States may not work uh, in Nairobi, mm -hmm. Kenya. And we need to be able to recognize uh, the social uh, aspects of One Health and its role in implementation. All of the uh, topics on gender context and cultural context, uh, relationships between um, humans and animals and the environment are very local. And so that has to be okay. part of the One Health. Uh, implementation science and the translation okay. uh, about, for example, antimicrobial resistance, uh, knowing that they exist is not the same as preventing uh, the transmission of resistant infections. We need mm -hmm. to be able to do that uh, at the population level. So those I, I think are key uh, that have not really been a part of the discussion on uh, competencies, but they're critical. Thank you. Great. Uh, Margaret. Sorry, my network. Yeah, so from where I stand, I, I see we need a very strong science communication skills because they help us really engage and reach to the hearts and minds of the, the different actors, the policymakers, the people at the bottom, the people at the top. Uh, and, and so if we are able to do that, science communication is one of the soft skills that we must build along the way. The second, of course, is um, that of partnership building. I think if you are able to accommodate, to be more accommodative by just learning how best human relationships work, then it will be so much easier for us to get these disciplines working together and the same case with the people working together because at the end of it is the people, is the people skills that will really build this one health culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Abuom. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think I'd like to agree with Margaret that uh, communication skills are key to the development of uh, one health as well as uh, how we develop partnerships and I also like to think we need to find ways of how to influence policy, how to take that research from uh, the publication to implementation at the level of uh, 
the Mamamboga. So how do we do that? How do we influence policy? So it's something that I think is very key. Mm -hmm. And we need to find ways of uh, enhancing this competency amongst uh, the different players in One Health. Thank you very much. Good. Caroline, you are in a unique position, forward looking. What do you have to say? I, I also agree that science communication is a key competency and also collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last but not least, uh, Mabel, in half a minute, what are your two key picks? Uh, digital uh, data analytics as a skill, because without evidence, will not advance too far. Second is skills around the area of uh, knowledge management. In one health, if it's multidisciplinary, uh, multi-sectorial, we are communicating to diverse audience. So we must mm -hmm. learn how to configure messages for the different audience, right from the community local to the policy makers. So that's a skill that we'll need to be able to break down those uh, silos. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for those uh, insights. Uh, the last question, uh, as we draw to a close and I'd hit into this. So putting everything in perspective, the discussions we have had uh, from where you stand, from what you have heard, the other panelists, and even the discussions yesterday, uh, what would be your key take home message? Very brief and sharp, what would be your key take home message and who should be listening to that message in particular? So uh, again, I have a prize, everybody half a minute. So let's start with Margaret. Yeah, my typical message is that um, One Health is the way to go. It's an approach that is going to help us resolve many of the uh, human, animal, agriculture, environmental challenges that, are, that our continent is facing today, in fact, our global community. And who should be listening to that? Policymakers, so that they can allocate okay. money and resources. Cool. Uh, Prof. Oladele. Thank you. We need to make sure that One Health Education is high quality, consistent, and reproducible across institutions. And that requires a board that is respected and their guidance of the competencies in my view. Professor Nangami is one of them. We have many at this conference. Uh, that quality control will ensure marketability, accreditation, and uh, support from all the professionals that contribute to One Health as an approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now that you mentioned Professor Nangami, uh, take your one minute or less to give us your key message and who should be listening to it. Evidence, evidence, evidence. Let the evidence speak for us. We cannot mm -hmm. preach without something in the hand. Uh, who should be listening to us? Uh, all those who are aligned in the education sector, including the researchers, as well as the implementers and the policy makers across all the disciplines, transdisciplinary and sectors. Thank you. Okay, cool. Caroline, as usual, we are in a unique position. You are next generation workforce. So what is your take home message to, to, to us? Let me put it that way. Um, my, my key message is that the principles of One Health uh, would really benefit not just the health sector, mm -hmm. but solve uh, several global issues, including climate change, biodiversity loss. And so I, I feel that One Health, and I know that One Health is, some, is, uh, is an approach that would benefit several uh, professions out mm -hmm. there in order to solve and even to achieve the SDGs. So um, yes, we should continually uh, not shy away from inviting various professions. Yes, mm -hmm. and they, they will definitely benefit from the One Health principles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular stakeholder who should be listening to that? 
Um, well, uh, I believe this is important for all actors, policymakers, okay. government, civil society. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Abuom, what are we taking home from you? Okay, thank you very much uh, once again. I think uh, I'd like to say work of, workforce development, one health workforce development is uh, key. Uh, I, don't, I think uh, lessons from COVID show us that uh, we are definitely not there as a, as a whole world. We need to enhance the development of uh, professionals who can work at, uh, as multidisciplinary teams and at different levels and also be able to influence uh, the different stakeholders, including government, uh, education, uh, professionals, uh, economists, the religious bodies, everyone. So we need to really widen the scope and uh, be able to influence all these different uh, professions mm -hmm. and different cadres from the Mamamboga to the president. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So from what you are saying, there is... Uh lots of opportunity, uh, lots of work to do, uh, great space, uh, lessons have been learned. Uh, we are beginning to see success. There's a lot of engagement, uh, but we definitely have some homework to do uh, jointly, uh, even if it's creating coherence or uh, uh, creating boundaries or breaking down silos. Uh, it's quite some work to do in order to to unleash the potential of One Health and what we can do with it. Uh, let me uh, stop here and thank all the presenters uh, for their contribution. Very nice presentations, very nice, very nice discussions. It has been a privilege to coordinate this. Uh, and I hope that the points that we have, we have gathered uh, will give us an agenda and inform the way forward as far as one Health uh, in Africa is concerned. So with those few remarks, let me hand over back to either Nick uh, or Leanne to close us up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much to our panelists, um, both the panelists that we've just seen and all our presenters from today. Thank you so much to Dr. Wellington for that wonderful chairing and to Dr. Bernard Bett and um, Professor Salome Bukacci um, for their chairing of the session earlier today. So um, we are running over time. So thank you to all of you all online who have uh, lasted the course. And I'm just going to remind you that we reconvene tomorrow at 13.45, so 1.45 Nairobi time with our really great um, session on sort of, we've worked through the, the research, we've looked at the capacity gaps, we've looked about gender mainstreaming. Now we really get to how we are gonna put this into policy and implementation. And that's where we start again tomorrow. So we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you very much. And we'll close there. Bye.